Oi, what's happening, gang? What is going on, people of the world? Welcome back to Twitch Tuesday. What's happening, gang? It is I. You cannot be done with me. What's happening, gang? Ray, what's happening, man? Dathar, what's going on? Well, Tuesday gaming canceled. You get to hang out with us? Holy hell, Dathar. That's good and bad. With delight. I think. Ray Silver with a resub. Five months in a row from Ray. Thank you, my friend. Massive support from Ray and the wife and the whole family all the time. Awesome to have you. Waited, waiting for some crazy old man to beat painting skills into your head on a small plastic Roman dude. <laughs> well, you know, if we said that anywhere except in this room, that might be weird. But here it's fine. Myrtle, what's going on? Love your face right back. Useless wizard, what's happening? I, I don't I don't feel like anybody's really useless. That name makes me sad. <laughs> he has spells like the useless wizard is the one that has spells like fresh air, right? So like when you're in the dungeon, you've got the fresh air smell. It clears farts. Like Sometimes that's cool, but most of the time it's practically useless. <laughs> Houdini7, what's going on? Snake, what's going on? Uh, what other color can you use in place of chocolate brown? Whatever brown you like. Oak brown from Army Painter. Any kind of dark brown. Really? Camo Specs, welcome back. My weekend was fantastic. I hope yours was as well. That goes for everybody. I hope you had a great weekend. If you got to join us on Sunday, we had a lot of fun on Gloves Off. Doing our final review of Deep Wars. We'll have something to talk about about that. We got the Deep Wars guys got in touch with us. They watched the stream after the fact. We had a really good conversation with them. I don't know that it changes anything. But <laughs> Ray Silver kicking us off with a five spot. Thank you, Ray. Mucho appreciado. <laughs> what's going on, everybody? Good old I see you out there. Kev Rob, tell a badger. What's happening, guys? What is going on? Houdini seven waiting on a conference call. That doesn't sound that doesn't sound, that doesn't sound good at all. Silver. Too British to quittish with the best Ice name on the Fuse. internet. What's happening? Don't ask the useless wizard to make a cup of tea. It never ends well. Oh, I can I can imagine. <laughs> Great name. Telemachus, have we been to Taco Tuesday? The smell of mancer is an asset. Oh, that could be a thing. The smell of mancer could be a thing. Fresh air casts fresh air. Fails roll. Splinter MD, what's going on? JDA, is it JDA's birthday? What? You're 58 today, JDA? Holy hell, congratulations, everybody. Let's get some love up in the chat for JDA. Some happy birthday hype. Let's do it. Let's do it. Uncle Touchy, yeah, lots of uh, Facebook back and forth about rules and what we, what they feel like we weren't catching on to versus what we were catching on to. It wasn't really an argument, but like we kind of said, with regards to Deep Wars, this is the Deep Wars guys, the developer got back with me and we had a very long discourse on Facebook after he watched some of the stream. And I explained to him, you know, our, our feeling about the combat system. And he says a lot of people have the same problem with the combat system, but it's kind of too late for them to change it without doing like a 3.0 set of rules. And they're not ready to do that yet. But it sounded like he was open for the discussion. He didn't want it to be like, you know, roll tons of dice. And I said, well, that's not it. Cause you never have like so many people involved in a fight to roll tons of dice, but hopefully we'll, hopefully we'll see it. I would love to see their game just make a couple of small alterations so that it could be available to more people. So wish them well. Mrs. Ray says, hi. Well, hello, Mrs. Ray. And hello, Ray fam. What's happening? Uh, what color and model air for chocolate brown? You don't have all the army painters, says Snake. Oh, uh, in uh, model air? Uh. Phew. Like German black brown is a good one. I think they have cam black brown and model air. Um, they have standard black brown and model air. Something like that. Just a dark brown. Off the top of my head, I can't think of one that's exact. I mean, that's why I use chocolate, right? Because chocolate brown is kind of chocolate brown. But it's 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 a lighter dark brown, if that makes any sense. The cam, bla cam black brown is a fantastic brown. That comes in model and model air. Uh, do I have any sitting right here? I thought I had some sitting right here. I might not. I thought I had some cam black brown sitting around here someplace. Anyway, cam black brown is a good one um, that you can use. Oh, yeah. German 
black brown right german camo the c stands for camo so this is german camo black brown it's in model color i believe that it's called the same thing in model or it may not sometimes they alter the name it might be just black brown um but it's a good one it's it obviously has a little bit more gray tone to it than the chocolate brown is kind of a good neutral that can go either um into you know uh, reddish browns yellowy browns greeny browns whatever you want but you can see how you can use the cam black brown as a base for chocolate you can then lighten this up with a little bit of like skeleton bone uh, or ivory or whatever you want to get more browns or put a little yellow into it or whatever you just wind up with a much darker base with the black brown if you send me a message i'll uh i can i can let you know we're not going to be using any of that today so don't worry about it if you have uh what i'll start the show off with obviously we're doing our paints along for arena rex uh red republic games down in austin texas got a great game arena rex and we're going to be painting up this guy the tribune uh for ludus magnus gladiator school uh, so we're going to be working on him. And today we're going to be working on flesh mainly. Uh, we'll see how far we get. If uh, we get done with flesh, then we're probably going to move to start basing some armor. Um, and so if you have colors, if you're painting along a model similar at your end, if you didn't get your hands on one of the Ludus Magnus models that we got out, um, then and you're painting along with something similar uh don't worry necessarily if you can't match colors exactly find something that's in the range uh, if you have questions during the show about colors that you need that are close just ask uh you can send me messages offline uh please email them to slowfuse at slowfusegaming.com or you can contact us directly through slowfusegaming.com on the contact page of the website um and ask me questions there that's where i collate all of those that i need to get back to with regards to painting questions and things like that so if you can shoot me questions over there um and uh and i'll follow them up hopefully fast enough so that during the course of the week uh tomorrow and friday and then into next week as we do continuation on this guy if we have to um that i can get you color questions answered and stuff but don't don't be too overwhelmed if you don't have a color that's specifically what i'm using um i'll i'll talk about each color that i'm using and why i'm using it and you can look at your collection and find something close or come up with a mix or in some cases you know just make do with another color entirely so we'll talk about it along the way don't feel like you have to do everything to a t like i do here all right Camel Specs, a scene from Airplane keeps going through your hair. Joey, do you like movies about gladiators? Scraps is a boy dog. <laughs> Trevarian, what's happening, man? Welcome back. Snake Man, Armor Brown is a little red, but close. Close, yeah. Armor Brown can be used. I feel like it's got a little bit more red. That's what makes Chocolate Brown so good, is that it's just, it's kind of a good medium brown. Right? And uh, I can't untether myself and go, well, here, I'll untether myself and I'll just go look. Hang on. If I were going to make the choice to find something to replace chocolate brown out of model air, that I would go with dark earth, right? So dark earth gets you pretty dang close. You can see there's a little bit more red content in the chocolate brown, right? But I feel like dark earth gives you the same basis because it's not... Okay, remember that when I talk color, it's not always the specific color. It's what the color does for you. And, and what, what I'm looking for out of my chocolate brown is I'm looking for it to give me a middle-of-the-road brown that I can use as a shadow layer when needed, or I can use it as that first highlight off of black or something like that. And, and the dark earth performs the same exact function. Um, the hue is a little off, but you can alter that if you could put just a little bit of mahogany inside of the dark earth and you'd get basically chocolate brown. So you can play around with it. But I think dark earth is your choice. If you're going to do that, do that thing. Grins, what's happening, man? You got your Malifaux gremlins in the mail? Fantastic. Quick question about Wasteland Soil. Is Vallejo Game Color 7812 a good substitute? Thanks. I don't know. I don't know them by their numbers, man. <laughs> I don't know them by their numbers. Oh, you say that's violet red? Yeah, probably. Probably. I mean, Wasteland Soil is is a, a fairly unique color in that its purple and red content are kind of 50-50, I feel like, right? It gives you enough of that pinkish hue in there that I really dig it, right? 
But yeah, it's again, what I'm looking for out of it is to get a little bit of red and a little bit of blue on the model simultaneously. If you went when you just had dark red and you had dark blue, you could do the same thing just by mixing them. So. Splinter, what's going on? Nephew's turned 11 and you're dying to get him into the hobby? Fantastic. Any recommendations on going on about it? You can't make up your mind which game to start him off with. 11 years old, I feel like... Uh, I mean, if you're if you're trying to get him into both playing and, and you know, getting into it, I feel like you can't go wrong with 40K. Um, obviously, that's a big uphill struggle to get them into a point where they feel like they can go play, like if they wanted to go play at a store against somebody later on, obviously got to add a lot of models. So if you're looking for something that's quick, down and dirty, kind of skirmish level, I really, really like Wrath of Kings for that. It's inexpensive to get into. I'm really, really digging Arena Rex. Um, the models are fantastic. The game only needs like a starter set with like, you know, three, you know, maybe four models to have a lot of fun with. You don't need a lot of terrain. Um, so I feel like that's pretty good. Um, the, the smaller level games, as far as model count, see if they're really into it, see if they enjoy the hobby part of it, what they enjoy about the game the most. I like starting small and working people larger. It, it avoids those hassles of spending hundreds, if not thousands of dollars to find out they don't like something. Assassin Red, what's going on? Hey guys, I want everybody to make sure you give some love to, uh, funny enough, Ugg Love, UG Love there in chat. What's going on, UG Love? That is Nick Padaraki. Uh, hopefully I didn't butcher your name, Nick. That he works with Red Republic Games. He is our Arena Rex dude in chat. The one that set us up with this wonderful thing that we got going on this week. And uh, so everybody show some love. And he's the guy. So uh, Nick, otherwise known as Uglove in chat, will be painting along with us. Doing the Tribune and answering questions, hopefully. Hopefully we can twist his arm to answer some, uh, some Arena Rex questions if you got him. He'll be paying attention. So everybody hype it up for uh, Nick in chat. Thank you for joining us, my friend. Thank you for joining us. Evan Flo, you are Spartacus? I've heard that. I've heard that about you. What's up, Mystic? Anthony Lone, what's happening, man? Welcome back. Oak Brown from Army Painter is also very good, Ray. Yep, Oak Brown is a really good dark brown. I use it a lot. Um, again, you know, you're just looking for a middle of the ground. If I put all of these up next to one another, you'll notice that none of them are the same, right? Brown has got a lot of variation, but you know, visually, they all perform the exact same role because of the shade out of the bottle. Uh, hue, I'm not so concerned with. Um, yeah, it, it helps sometimes, but I can always alter hue with just simple, thin uh, filter glazes over the top of a color. So I'm not really super worried about it. But if you've got Army Painter, Oak Brown is, my, is a great go-to brown for base coats. Chocolate Brown on Model Color, Model Air, Dark Earth, I feel like are all really good. GW has got like, uh, it used to be called like Scorch Brown, was one of my favorite colors ever. Uh, I don't think they call it Scorch Brown anymore, but whatever, GW. GW has got a color that's the same. You just want kind of one that's not too dark, obviously not too bright. You don't want to go into tans and deserty colors for a, for a utility brown. Camo Spec says, I'm not a freaking paint computer. I don't know things by number. <laughs> you can definitely go wrong with 40K. Ravenous Oracle, what's going on, man? Welcome back. Good to see you. Max Payne, what's happening? Uh, Ray, you just realized there's no purple or lime green on the table. You're not in your comfort zone. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. This isn't next level painting. But um bump. Kappa Kinney. James, stay stealth. What's happening, man? What's going on? All right, everybody. Welcome to Tuesday. Hope everybody had a wonderful weekend. As you know, we are kicking off our Arena Rex week this week. We talked about it a little bit on Gloves Off, our Sunday talk show. Uh, we did our final review of Deep Wars. Make sure you go back and read uh, or watch that VOD on Twitch, and we'll be posting it up on YouTube in the next couple of days um, as we go through kind of our final, you know, uh, views and, and kind of solutions that we thought we could do to help out with uh, the Deep Wars set. And then talking a little bit into Arena Rex, which is where you'll see us focus this week, painting up the Tribune in our first ever paint along um and then playing it's jen's birthday this coming sunday and jen is going to be playing uh the moraturi that you saw on sunday with uncle touchy painting up which he's doing a fantastic job on his side of the arena rex crew and uh the moraturi are kind of like that egyptian kind of quality i want to say i don't know if that's really really true in in lore but it seems to be as i follow through the book that that's kind of it um, they have that North African feel to them, you know, across the med kind of feel that, uh, and, and so they bring a really cool kind of faction feel to the game. And then I'm doing Ludus Magnus, which is kind of that traditional, uh, Roman gladiator school. And, uh, we're going to be fighting it out. So Jen's going to be kicking my butt in miniature games. So the first time ever live on stream, Jen playing with little men. I think that's a thing. I think it's okay to say that maybe. 
<laughs> Insane fire, what's going on, man? Welcome. Ptolemaic Egyptian death cult. Yep. Nice. Nice, Ugg. It's the feel they get. I really dig it. The sculpts on all the models tell a really good story. You get a feel uh, of not only dynamicism and miniature, um, but I really like the way that they've put it together. You don't have... Not everybody's huge, right? We'll get into the models a little bit. Um, you know, I've got... We're going to be focused on the Tribune this week uh, as we go through our paints along. So I've got him just primed. Uh, what a paint along is, for those of you that are just joining us, is we got uh, 12 lucky members of our viewer uh, squad out there were able to get this model in their hands thanks to the guys over at Arena Rex. Um, and uh, got it before it was even released, and we're able to put it together, prime it, and we're going to be going through and working through all the techniques it takes to create a finished model uh, with a specific look at this guy, and we'll be able to see what all of the viewers, uh, including Nick from Arena Rex, who Uglove and Chad is going to be painting along with us, we'll be, they'll be uploading to our community gallery so we can follow that progress, kind of in that distance learning classroom sense. So we'll see multiple people with the same model at hopefully very near the same stages as we work through the painting process and we can give feedback and see what they're doing, how they're altering the technique that I'm teaching, maybe playing with color to get different models all out of the same exact kind of starting point. So it's going to be really exciting. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, if you guys like this concept, please let us know because we're working with other manufacturers uh, to do the same kind of thing, be able to bring pre-release style models out, work them together as paint-alongs, use them to teach uh, new techniques and certain color combinations and applications of paint that, uh, uh, that you might not see otherwise. So good stuff. Hoping to have a good time with it. Kelly Time Painting, what's happening, man? Gnozel, after finding out there was a metal Thunderhawk, you immediately went, you need that? No, you can't. They, they don't make that anymore. Hey, somebody likes You're us. gonna pay like 500 bucks for it if you can find it anyway. Coram Mac, thank you for the follow. Welcome, my friend. Uh, what is this, like, pay for 15 minutes of stream thing going on? What kind of cam show are you watching? I don't even know what you're talking about. Hey, somebody likes us. I don't even know what you're talking about. Connor SK, welcome. Thank you for the follow, my friend. Okay, so first off, let's talk about color. Um, you know, one of the things that I get a ton of questions, literally every week I get probably a dozen questions asking me about my, my kind of core go-to paints, how I select what paints I use when I develop a mini. We did a stream about a month or two ago about color theory. That one we published over on YouTube as well. Um, so you can go and watch that. We talked about uh, how we pick colors to do a Morat uh, I think a Suryat miniature from Infinity, and what goes through my head in particular right, as I'm putting sense. colors on the table and trying to figure out, all right, what's going to make sense on this particular model? In the case of something like the Arena Rex model with the Tribune, you know, we've got really great art that comes on the box, okay? So um, it gives you kind of a starting point, and I'm always, uh, I'm, I'm not fanatical, but I'm always very positive about looking at what other artists have done with a particular model and get a sense for how the studio's vision for a model came through, um, especially on something that has a lot of flesh. Uh, you know, what nationality was the model? Is it dark skin? Is it alien? Is it, you know, get a sense of what they intended it to be so you know kind of how it fits the storyline um, and uh, the narrative of the game um, if you want to follow that. If you just want to go completely rogue and pick all your own colors, throw the box away and start from scratch. There are no rules, but I like to take a step through and just kind of visually get, um, you know, take it all in and see, okay, the color palette that they're using here, um, not overly dark, obviously white robes. Uh, they've got this very, very, what appears in the artwork to be like a polished bronze armor, obviously fitting with the age, uh, almost to the course of it looking white on here. So almost silvery with the polish. So we're going to work a little bit away from that in ours here. We're going to go with a little deeper bronze so that the bronze and the skin stand off a little bit. So that's kind of where my thought process goes when I'm picking colors. Um, if we apply this on paint uh, on a model that also, you know, conducts its own shadows, two-dimensional art, very different than three-dimensional artwork. Obviously, the miniature creates its own shadows by nature of being a physical object. So... In order to get contrast on a model that's also creating its own dark spots, we need to do a lot of that with hue. So I'm going to work our metals up. If you've been following along uh, up on the store, we had it. Uh, the armor is going to be basically going through with a burnt umber base and then working up into some brighter uh, bronzy gold colors uh, through our plague and parasite brown golden yellow and ivory uh, and then we'll knock it back a little bit with our light green rlm for some tarnish on there to get some green they've got some really nice like light green hue in here so we're going to bring a little bit of that to life 
but that'll give the armor the ability to contrast a little bit more with the flesh because the flesh is not it's going to be kind of an olivey caucasian skin uh that mediterranean tanned flesh is what we're going for on this guy and so in order to just make sure that the skin value doesn't fall right in line with the armor we're going to pick colors that kind of stand apart from one another, even though the flesh is going to be heavily brown and, you know, with some pinkish in it and some green for the olive. Uh, the armor, we want it to stand out a little bit more. So I'm going to go with a little bit more of a bright gold on that. Um, and then for the robes, we're going to go with just a dirtier look. Uh, I think if you uh, bought the colors from the store, we're going with the dark green RLM 71 uh, along with hemp and then into skeleton bone. And then we'll be working some white over that. So we won't go with pure white. Uh, and again, so that I can bring dirty, uh, a dirty. little bit of a different color palette on there and stark white on these cool robes on this guy just is not something that I feel like complements the model really well. I want to give it a worn look. I love this guy. The model's fantastic. I can see him appealing to the crowd, you know, as he just smacks somebody over the head. It's awesome. Lindsay, welcome to the snails. Thank you for that follow, my friend. All right, so just kind of the basics. Um, as I go through each individual color, we'll talk more about why and how it relates to the model. Um, but to just start off, it's really my, my, my goal is to make sure that I'm choosing colors that stand apart on the model, but all complement one another enough in sense of the overall composition um, that you know, I'm not painting uh, bright primary colors. You know, while they may look good together in the rainbow, <laughs> you know, uh, on a model, not so much. Uh, they start to make the eye struggle with where to look for details. So you want colors that don't really create headaches when you're looking at it, um, but that can also separate out the details enough so that we can see what's what. We can tell what's armor, what's flesh, what's cloth, what's leather, what's wood. Uh, we've got some really unique textures on this guy, so I'm really excited about that. So today we're gonna start with flesh. The Dapper Russian, welcome. Thank you for that follow. And I gotta find a place to put all these paints. Holy hell. They're just gonna go off to the side. Cause we are going to start with flesh tones. And this is our flesh base that we're working on. And some of you are gonna be like, what the? So there's green in here. And there's a very, very nice, I love Wasteland Soil from Army Painter. Um, the flesh tones that we've chosen over a black base. Remember, I told you guys we're not going to be pre-highlighting this guy. Uh, reason being, when we do these paint-alongs, I'm never sure what people's capability for their starting point is. Some people have airbrushes, some people don't have airbrushes. Um, in order to pre-highlight correctly, it either takes a ton of time if you're doing it with the brush, or it's very quick and you have to have an airbrush. Um, because I can't guarantee who has an airbrush as they're painting along with us, and because we don't want to spend an entire stream doing brush pre-highlights, we're just going to go straight over black primer. Um, which is something that we don't normally do. You know, normally when I'm painting, I go through with a pre-highlight. You'll see the white on this guy. This is one of the other uh, gladiators in the Lunas Magnus set, but you can see how we pre-highlighted him. And then I've gone in and started working up the flesh tones on him. We did this in a one-on-one -on -one tutorial yesterday. And, uh, you know, so uh, a pre-highlight allows your color choices to be a little different. Um, you can go a little bit darker with your flesh tones because going over that white pre-highlight, they lighten up. Uh, in our case, we're not doing that. We're just going to start right off the gate with tan flesh over black. It's going to help the tan flesh become very, very dark, which is what we want um, without the pre-highlight. So that's that. Then we're going to move into uh, some barbarian flesh, which is our next highlight color. Assassin Red, five months in a row. Thank you, my friend, for all the support. A hero. What's going on? Kenny's in the room. My Lord Megatron, what's going on? Happy Tuesday to you too, my friend. You want a metal Thunderhawk for no reason, basically. I, yeah, good luck on finding one. They were horrible, and they're tiny, by the way. Their scale is horrible. But, yeah. James Day Stealth, the raffle is on. Raffle is running. I always start it before the stream now because I always forget otherwise. So the raffle is on, although we do not have a raffle to do quite yet. But type exclamation point booty in chat, and you can be entered in. Okay, um, after that, we've got uh, basically colors that we're using for uh, just bringing in the right hue onto the model. So the cam dark green that we're using from Vallejo Model Air is a color that gives us a really nice kind of ruddy, um, dirty green that takes the place of that, that uh, subdermal vein kind of color in skin. Also brings in a little bit of that olive feel that we want for the the part of the world that we're dealing with, right? It's not just 
you know, tan people don't look the same everywhere. And so a little bit of green with yellow in it is going to help give us some color onto the skin as well. Uh, the wasteland soil, again, for the subdermal capillary stuff, the reds that you see in your hand, you know, you get uh, reds and pinks on your knuckles, spots where the, the blood vessels are close to the skin. Um, and then you get these green spots, right, that run through where you've got veins, right, again, through the knuckles, right, where we've got that subdermal blood flow happening, right? Greens running underneath the skin here. So that's what the cam dark green is going to play with. And the wasteland soil is going to represent all these pinks and reds in the flesh as well. And we'll use them in a variety of ways to get that kind of density on the skin. Uh, and then last but not least, troll claws. And troll claws is a weird choice for us because unlike something like, a, like an elf flesh that keeps us in that pink kind of skin range uh, as we highlight, Troll Claws, again, brings in a little bit of yellow uh, for that olive kind of hue and also gives us a highlight up off of Barbarian skin, right? So we can go brighter for the tops of muscles um, and still bring in some hue with that too. So never be afraid to move into colors that you don't really necessarily think of in terms of skin, um, you know, whereas normally tan flesh, barbarian flesh, elf flesh is a great triad, you'll see me remove certain colors. I'll take tan flesh out and use like fur brown sometimes if I want to go even darker. Um, I might take uh, and put that in, and in this case, take out elf flesh and use, I could use skeleton bone, you know, if I wanted to give it more of a pale flesh tone or a dead flesh tone. Um, so you'll find yourself kind of moving around a center point. Barbarian flesh is a pretty good center point. Um, of course, if you wanted to go even darker, you could remove your highlight color and drop down to a much darker base, and your highlight could be a lot less. Uh, that's what we were working on with this guy so that his highlight on his flesh tone is less Caucasian, more tan, more, you know, Middle Eastern almost, uh, as opposed to, you know, if you were to go up with a, high, a brighter highlight. So you can play around all with the same colors. So once you find a flesh set, it can be a game color flesh set, it can be, uh, you know, the Vallejo model color, the Panzer Aces, GW, whatever it is, if you've got a good triad, a dark flesh, a mid-tone flesh, and a flesh highlight, You'll find yourself, uh, you know, kind of working around those and centering depending on how dark you want the flesh to go. If we were doing African skin tones, we could go even deeper here and remove the barbarian flesh altogether and go in with something even darker, like an oak brown on the bottom and do oak, fur, and, and tanned flesh. And you can do uh, very, very good African style skin tones here that are just pinkish enough, you know, to make them realistic, but are centered around a darker color. So you'll find yourself migrating your colors around. You don't have to have 50 million of them. You can mix and blend as you go. But in our case, we're going to stick with Tanned and Barbarian to start off with, and then we'll go in with some of these other detail colors as we roll. So, that's a mouthful. Snot Rash, what's happening? Would Vallejo Black Green or Army Painter Angel Green be acceptable substitutes for Cam Dark Green? Is that what you're asking, Ray? The Cam Dark Green, um, as, as a color, is very unique because it has kind of a, a really good yellow content, which is why I use it. So, um, you know, the, the Black Green, if you put a spot of probably, oh, like yellow ochre in the Black Green would probably work. Because really what we're looking for here is that you want a green that isn't so... Uh, uh, what's the right word to say? If I go in with just a like a, a deep, dark green, right? Like the angel green, right? Angel green is a green that tends more towards blue, right? And so this, on your as, as you glaze it on the skin, is going to take you in a realm that you're going to have to be very, very careful because it doesn't really have any components of the flesh tones that we're working on in it. Um, it's going to bring very prominent color onto the model, which may not be a bad idea, but you can tell the difference here, right? I've got this one that gives me, I call it that ruddy green. It's got some yellowy content in it that's going to go along more with flesh tones. So as I work it in light, I can build it up, build it up, build it up. This one is going to go on and do a lot for you in your first pass because the hue is so kind of uh, standoffish, I guess, to the rest of the model. So I wouldn't recommend something like an angel green. Um, if you're working in the realm of army painter, I would think that something like elf green would be really good. Uh, the elf green has got a good yellow content to it, just like the cam dark green. It's just a little bit lighter. So like we talk about whenever you're glazing, uh, as you go through that process, the color that you put on after you thin it down quite a bit, it becomes brighter on the model when going over brighter colors. So just be careful if you're going to use something like this. It doesn't have the same uh, you know, shade to it right out of the gates. 
Uh, another one is this Crypt Wraith is pretty good. Again, you know, more of a browny, yellowy green, and this is a lot darker. So this might be better if you've got that, if you're working with Army Painter. All right, so let's get going. Let's get this party started. Break out your tanned flesh, folks. Whatever your darker flesh tone is. And let's get this show on the road. I love this model. So first thing, we're going to be painting very, very thin. For all of you that have the model, for all of you that may just be watching and taking notes, uh, realize that I paint about as thin as you can paint without just using water by itself. All right. And so I guess the first thing I should probably do is bust out a piece of palette paper, perhaps, and walk us through the thickness test so that you guys can get a good vision of how we'll be painting. Like when I say I'm going over to the palette to get more color, you guys will know exactly what I'm talking about because I'm going to show you the process. Okay, so I just use standard wax palette paper. This is just Hobby Lobby stuff. Buy it by the sheet. I work in big sheets of it. I go over to my water jar over here. I'm going to bring it over here. Start with fresh, clean water whenever you start a new color palette. Um, so I go in and, you know, basically you're just going to clean your brush. I just rotate my brush on the sidewall whenever I clean it at a fairly steep angle like this. Um, and then instead of like normally if you were, you know, cleaning your brush, you'd clean it and then you drag it up the side to get most of the water off of it, you know, kind of flick the water off of it or whatever. And you're left with, you know, barely anything on the brush. You dry it off. Instead, the way I paint is I come over here, clean the brush, and then I literally take it straight out of the water, right, to start using. And so you'll notice now I get a ton of water on there, right? Look at the sheen on my skin as I'm painting, right? So all of that water I'm using, all right? I'm not wiping it off. I don't keep a paper towel here to wipe my brush off on. You'll notice I build up a lot of paint during the course of the stream on my thumb because I use my thumb as kind of my sponge, so to speak. So I'll take that out of the water, filled with water, and then go over to my palette here. Let's put a drop of paint on the palette paper. Okay, and then I'll bring a fully loaded brush, has all that water on it. And then I come right over here and grab a tail, what I call a tail, right out of this brush, or right out of this dot of paint, right? Just touching the brush to the edge of the paint, not in the middle, right? Just to the edge of the paint and start working a little bit of paint out like this. All right, and that's about how thin we're going to start with. All right, and the goal here is that as you take the paintbrush and move it across the palette, you get a very translucent color behind it, and you push all that paint to a dot on the other side, right? And you want that dot to remain somewhat cohesive, right? It'll form a drop shape again, so to speak. If it goes through and, and starts spreading back across this way too much, let's put more water in there, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Like if I just put another brush load worth of water in here and I string it across, notice how now that doesn't retain a nice droplet of paint. Notice how it gets dark all the way back through here, all right? That's probably too thin. There's chances that you can use that for things, but you really want to be able to move the droplet over here and have it stay, right? But leave this translucent paint behind. And you can see how here we've got too much water because the paint is diluting itself all the way back through the suspension across the palette, right? So in that case, I'll add a little bit more paint to it. Again, just working from the tail of paint up here. And I just want to be able to make that brush stroke go across and have that paint, that dark spot, kind of stay in a spot right over here. Notice how now it's, it still will blend through, but it, notice how it's not washing all the way back through the suspension, right? So I've still got my translucent paint behind, right? And my drop of paint stays over here. Push it back the other side. It stays over on the left. It doesn't melt back into all of our color. That's how I paint 99.9% .9 of the time, right? So just so you know, as we go through this process, that's how I'm painting pretty much the whole time. I'll tell you if I'm going even thinner. Whenever I say, hey, we're gonna paint thinner than normal, it's thinner than what I just showed you. Uh, if I say we're going thicker than normal, spiky bits with a host. Thank you, my friend. All right, so if you go through and hear me say that we're going to go a little thicker than normal, then you're gonna add more paint than what you saw me just say. So that gives you kind of that balancing point where I'm at, and then you just watch how it comes off of my brush as we go through and paint. All right, I'm gonna my light set up here. 
Everybody's like, quit talking, Fuse. Put paint on the model. All right, let's do this. I guess I could just use this paint I just put on this palette, huh? All right. And you know the drill. Hey, somebody We're just going to go us. through and start grabbing parts of his skin. Trying very hard to stay off of all of the other things on the model. If he's got, he's got this armband that separates where his arm connected to the model. His right arm here was a separate piece, and you can see how they've done a really good job by giving us this armband that falls right across the bicep. Right. Very nice. Toranok, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Splinter MD, any reason to not go with a wet palette? Um, I find that wet palettes are really good when well, you are that, attempting uh, to go through uh, and, uh, and, you know, mix a bunch of paints. For me, in Arizona, the climate is so dry that my wet palette dries up. The brush or the uh, sponge itself dries so quick that I don't benefit from what a traditional wet palette gives you. Um, which is, you know, the ability to go through and have that mixing. If you mix a paint, it'll stay wet on that palette a lot longer than it will if you just do it on palette paper or things like that. So it saves me from having to waste paint, so to speak. Uh, but no, I don't use a wet palette. I, my, my, if I turn the palette cam on for us over here, where you can see my uh, actual palette. If the scroll wheel will work on my mouse, I got to replace this. So my palette cam here, you can see like all of this area is all sitting on top of my wet palette box. This big box is a, is a 15 or 17 inch wet palette. It's a huge deal. I just, I can't use it. The sponge dries up, it curls at the corners. I wind up fighting with it more than not. It just isn't worth it to me. But I don't, I don't say they're bad things. Just in a dry climate, it's kind of useless. All right, let's turn that back off. And you'll notice that as I come from the palette with all that water and paint on my brush, I'll take my first stroke on my thumb just to make sure that I don't have so much paint that I put big blotches on the model, right? Because as you touch the model or with the brush the first time, you're going to get a lot of that water content wanting to come off of the brush, out of the bristles and onto the plastic, right? And so to avoid that building up and being something you got to hassle with to move that paint around from a big spot so it doesn't water stain and all that stuff, I prefer to wipe off and I know it's kind of wasteful because you're putting a lot of the paint that you would otherwise use on your thumb, right? But it keeps it from dousing the model with a bunch of paint all at once. And that's what we don't want. We don't want paint pooling up. And you can see as I'm building up, we're getting more and more color content, but it's very, very dark compared to the color on the palette, right? We're very, very dark because we're going over this black base and that's what we want. It keeps us from having to use, you know, 14 different colors for skin. I don't have to go on with a dark brown. Um, this lighter tanned flesh, which is funny because it's actually a very dark flesh color, but this lighter tanned flesh um, gives us a very, very nice shade tone when we paint it very thin over that black. And so the key here is just to make sure that as you paint over the black, that you keep it consistent. Try not to let big brush strokes show in it. You don't have to worry a whole lot, but you just don't want, you know, huge dark areas because thin paint will allow it to be spotty if you let it. Just make sure you're getting good coverage. You can go back over areas. As you do, it will lighten up and become closer to the color that we're painting with. So in this case, the tan flesh will become more and more visible on the model the more and more layers we put on. This first one, we're just trying to make sure we don't have too much black showing. And, and for a lot of people, this hurts their head because they spend their whole life bitching about paints that look like this when you put them on a model. Um, you know, we talk about how hard it is to paint with yellows because yellows, if you go over primer, don't look yellow at first. They get all cloudy and ugly and things like that. I'm showing you that that's okay. All right, don't worry about it. I mean, you can see on mine, look at how cloudy looking this paint appears. If I can get that to focus in for us. I got just a hair, like that. All right. You'll notice how cloudy it's getting. That's fine. Don't fight it. Paint and thin, that's what happens. All right. As we layer, all of that will go, go away. Wasted Land Wanderer, thank you so much for the bits. Thanks for the bits. Horse meat scandal. What the hell we got going on in chat? All right. Just keep it up. Let's paint this entire arm. Got a... 
bracelet on, and then he's got this arm guard that we want, or this forearm bracelet. I don't even know what the hell you call that. What do you call a bracelet on your fore or on your upper arm like that? Not even sure. Man jewelry. No idea what it's about. Hey, somebody likes us. Brutan, what's going on? Thank you for that follow. Hey, somebody likes us. Alulu, what's going on? Thank you for the follow. Genuine, I see you out there. Nah, it's not a grieve. It's a bracelet up on his, his bicep. I think greaves are on your legs, right? I don't know. Again, here we're just going for coverage. Beamington, what's going on? So just keep working in this very, very thin consistency over the whole model. Try not to layer up too much in any one area until you have a good coat on everything. Because um, one thing that will happen as you paint thin like this, you will struggle with, okay, like, you know, like this area, like, let's say back here, um, you know, I want to make this muscle brighter. And that's what, you know, my brain tells me to do. You know, I want to start highlighting up these muscle groups. That's fine. Don't do it until you get the whole arm covered, right? And the reason for that is so that you don't over highlight an area and wind up where this base coat then needs to be shaded back down. Right, we're really trying hard to make sure that as we paint, we don't have to go back and fix too much as far as value on a model. And it's tougher when we don't have our pre-highlight going on, but still, think about it. Think about where on this arm the brighter spots would be. Obviously, across the top for him, right? This guy's outside in an arena, sun beaming down from up high, so that's how we're gonna paint it. But we're not worried about that right now. First thing we wanna get is just full coverage. We wanna get this filter of tan flesh on the whole model. And then we'll come back and start worrying about value, peaking some of those muscles out in high contrast. Etc. etc. Here we just want a good even consistent color across the whole model. Now, if I'm looking at this, I think that's a bare hand, yes. Again, I'm loading most of my water and paint on my thumb there, so I'm not getting a big pool of it. It's almost like a wash, except it's not trying to find low spots in the model. It's just kind of moving around on the model. And basically what this is doing is allowing enough of that black to show through that we're getting all of the shading for in between muscle groups, you know, underneath the arm and the shadowed areas. We're getting all of that tone set up, all right? Because it's the only color that's on the model, sometimes you'll lose track of that, that you know, you start thinking, oh, but this looks like crap if this is supposed to be a skin tone. Well, that's not really what we're doing right now. What we're doing is we're trying to set up what the skin's shadows look like, all right? So we're not, that's why we're not being as concerned with what you know, the, the value is right now. We just wanna make sure we don't over brighten. Right? Don't want to put too many layers of paint on the model with this color because that will make the shadows too bright. Make sense? Like these areas right around his wrist guard, right? The areas underneath like the shoulder muscle here, right? We want to make sure that that color that we see is the color that's going to be on the model for the sh shadow of the skin.
By the way, guys, if we do have any giveaways today, we will do them all at the end. I don't want to interrupt the paint along and the process that we're going through during the course of the stream. So if we do have any raffles, they will happen at the end of the show. I have no fear. We will get to them. Uh, we will also only be doing whip at the end of the show, and I will be focused first on the work of everybody in the paint along. So don't feel awful if at the end of the show we have a whole bunch of paint along picks and I don't get to any of the standard work and process stuff. During these paint alongs, the real focus is going to be to take a look at what everybody's doing who's painting this same model, uh, or maybe a similar model if somebody else is painting something else from Arena Rex. Right. So I'm just making sure that I'm through here. Now going back and highlighting a little bit on the upper muscles. I'm not putting paint in the shadows now. I'm just going on top of the muscles to kind of smooth out some of that thin cloudiness, top of the shoulder, top of the bicep. Good sculpts here. All the muscles are fairly pronounced, right? You'll notice now it's starting to brighten up pretty good. Go ahead and take this and brighten it up a little bit more on the bicep here. Trying to stay away from the muscle shadows. So in between the bicep and the muscle group down below, just leave that darker color in there. Palm of the hand, brighten it up a little bit. Same color. When I say brighten it up, it just means we're putting another layer of paint on it. Every layer gets us closer to the actual color of tanned flesh. You don't want to go fully opaque, right? That black is still having a very good effect through the skin tone here. We don't want to lose that, right? Notice how we're picking up the wrinkles in the hand. That's still that dark flesh just interacting with the black. The shadow between the bicep is still there. We don't want to lose any of that. Got to get top of the shoulder as it comes over here. One big thing to mention, when we're working thin like this, you can't overwork an area. I mean, you can, you're gonna hate yourself. You know, if, as I put paint on the top of the shoulder part that I missed before, I wanna do about as much as I've done now and leave it alone for a second. Um, the thinner your paint gets as you're placing it on the model, the more it will start to tear. Uh, and uh, basically we just call it break on the model because at some point in time you overload the pigment with too much water and the pigment doesn't seem to stick. It moves around the model in weird ways, sloughs off entirely, goes back down to just black undercoat. So if you're painting this thin, do a small coat, work on something else, right? Go and we'll move on to, you know, the other arm perhaps or the legs, and then you can come back. It dries pretty quick, at least for me here in Arizona. For you, depending on your <laughs> humidity, it may not. Like right now, it's already dry enough that I can go back again and brighten that up just a little bit on the top area here. But just don't keep working it. You know, the first time you put the color on, it's gonna be darker than you want perhaps, and you're gonna feel the need to go and attack it again. Let it dry, let it set up a little bit. Doesn't have to be for a long time. A couple minutes is generally good enough because when you go back with that next bright or uh, you know fully loaded brush of water, you don't want it to reactivate the pigment that's already there and move it around. Now you've, now you've basically done two operations to achieve one layer of paint. So it's a waste of time. So just let the paint work and set up a bit. So just smoothing this out a little bit. Working now only on the top side of the arm where it's gonna be facing the sun, not putting any more paint down below. Top of the bicep, top of the forearm here. Now what you start to see is that even though we're working super thin, you're getting this neat contrast in color, the way the hue is building up there. 
right? We start to see, notice how the top of the, the shoulder, top of the bicep, top of the forearm, same exact color, but because now there's less of the black showing up through it as we layer up, now I get more shadow down beneath, right? So we start building up very, very subtle shades. We're not trying to do too much with this color. Um, you could keep putting it on and putting it on and putting it on and do a lot more work with it, but we've got other colors that we want to do first. So we don't want to overdo it here. We don't want to start highlighting muscle groups to kind of their end state because we still got a lot of other color we got to put on this guy. We've got the cam dark green. We've got the uh, wasteland soil. We've got uh, two more stages of flesh tone that have to go on here. So you're not trying to, you know, uh, <laughs> Rome wasn't created in a day. Very fitting in this one. Just let this be exactly what we said it was going to be. This is the shadow tone for the skin that's going on. So it can afford to stay a little darker. Don't get too carried away. I'll just grab a little bit more on the top side of the shoulder here and on the inside of the bicep as well. And the forearm on this side. Same thing. Now you start seeing that bicep muscle start showing up a little bit better. Our skin shade tone is there. All of this with just one color of paint. So you're not having to worry about washing. You're not having to worry about, you know, any other um, technique. You're literally just painting with thin paint over itself time and time again, picking where you want to put the paint based on where the light source is on the model. In this case, just overhead light source. So just the top stuff, right? We'll get the thumb here. I think I missed the back of the thumb somehow originally. Palm of the hand again to make sure that I keep it as bright as the forearm. Notice how from this angle you can see the forearm top of the bicep is now brighter than the palm of the hand. So we wanna just add another layer there. Always check the model as you're adding more layers. If you add a layer, say on you know the top of the arm, Make sure that the entire top of the arm that has the same facing towards your light source is brought up to the same kind of brightness. I'm kind of stippling in here on the palm so that I maintain a little bit of that dimension of the wrinkles in the inside of the hand. I don't want to just slop a bunch of paint in here at this point. I want to make sure that I keep some of that wrinkle of the palm going. That. So there's a little bit of that black primer still showing through the skin tone there in the middle of the hand. And then again, let's layer up the side a little bit. The key, work thin, remove most of your paint, and then work with very, very little pigment on your brush as you go. Right, this side of the forefinger is going to be brighter right down here along the knuckle going on to the top of the hand as it goes underneath into shadow. We'll just brighten up the sides of the fingers a little bit. So. All right, now we're starting to see the beginnings of flesh happening, right? Underside of the hand remains a little dark. Underside of the forearm remains a little dark. From this angle, we get a kind of a darkness except on the outside of the hand or the thumb side of the hand there, right? Then as we move around, we get a little bit of brightness on the muscle, all just from layering up. And each section of the model, you'll have to pay attention to how you layer it based on how it faces our light source. Some sections will be darker than others, obviously. I changed my water just for this. I change my water every time I move on to new models. So like if we're painting, um, a, a lot of people ask me this, which is funny. So if we're painting Ferris Manus and I've got greens and blacks and flesh tones and all of that, I use that water pretty much for the whole time I'm painting Ferris Manus because I'm weird. I like to know that the residual pigment from all the colors I've used is what I'm cleaning my brush with. I feel like it, whatever pigment comes out of my dirty water onto the model, um, I'm okay with that because it's all the same pigment I've used across the whole model. So I feel like it gives me, and it may or may not do this at all. I don't have any science base behind it, but I'm not mad at using dirty water as long as the dirty water only includes pigments I've used on that particular model. When I switch to another model, even if the color range is very similar, I generally will clean the water. Yeah, but I don't clean my water every day. I just don't.
bicep bracelet. I guess that's it's a man bracelet. Hairdo, watching and working. What's going on, man? Hoods Gate, what's happening? Ready to roll. Welcome back. Grins, it's one thing you really love about appreciating and painting uh, Rumble Slam minis. It makes sense for every mini to be done in a topward angle OSL as they're a wrestling ring and the light is usually directly overhead. Yeah, exactly. And the same thing for this. You know, um, normally what we would be doing is is working over a pre-highlight, right? We did on uh, this guy, right? We've got the pre-highlight on him that is just a white light coming down with white. It's just white paint over it that allows us to still have good shadow, you know, on the underneath sides, things like that. Um, and then when you go over it with your flesh tones, you'll find that your first base layer is brighter than, uh, than it normally would be because there's white showing through as well as black. So you get some of that immediate contrast. But when you don't have the ability to pre-shade, you don't have an airbrush, uh, you don't want to try to pre-shade just with rattle can. You're not going to like it. It's going to put too much texture on the model. Um, and you don't feel like you're ready to just kind of work through and do it with a brush because it takes a lot of time. You can. You know, we've got, we spent a whole stream on Friday, I believe, doing the same kind of pre-highlight on a Space Marine, only with a brush, right? So you can create the same thing, just in a very loose, kind of sketchy style, uh, painting highlights on with white that gives you a really good basis for going through and then adding color onto the model. Um, there's no reason why you can't do it with a brush. It just takes a long time because you're having to build up with very thin layers so that you get all the grays. You're going to be using gray on here because you're not getting the aerosol effect of the of the uh, the airbrush. So you know you're working with a lot more color. You're basically painting the whole model black and white. You know, like old timey movie style first before adding color to it. So I won't say it doubles the amount of time you spend on a model, but it adds a lot of time. Right? So rather than do that here, we're just showing you you can achieve the same results. We can get you know the same style of highlight and value on skin. You know you'll see our pinkish tones in here. If I turn this right, you see some green in the the muscle shading there. Right. So we've already got a really good start on this guy um, with the pre highlight, and it just made it a little bit quicker. But we'll get the exact same effect on this guy without any pre highlight at all. Here it just requires you to use a little bit more of your brain power to determine where the bright colors are going to go as opposed to having the cheat sheet that already had the white paint on there, how it would fall from a light source. And the only reason we're not doing it here, like I said, is because as a paint along, I'm not ever sure uh, what people in the audience have got as utility. You know, you may just have, you know, the set of brushes and the paints you bought from us and the model. And so I want to make sure that everybody's got the ability to get this thing going uh, and you don't have to have particular tools. All right, we're going to move over to the left arm now. We've got a good basis on the other. So same thing over here. Just find all the parts that are skin, start giving yourself a good layer of tan flesh, very, very thin. Here we've got a lot of this arm is going to remain in shadow as it goes in towards the body since it's down close to his side. So a little bit less layering is necessary on this one. You do want to make sure you go ahead and get the skin tone over all of the black. We try to not leave any of the, you know, the primer black showing by itself. As tempting as it may be in some locations to just leave black in the shadows, it is gonna look very funny at the end of the model, right? Black is not a color that just, you know, you see a lot in nature, right? You want it to just be dark flesh tone up underneath there. So again, don't overwork it. Just get a good first layer on there. You can see how there's some up underneath in the, in, in kind of the inside of the arm there, inside of the bicep, not too much. We're gonna to wanna to go and put a little bit more in there, but the, it's so wet right now. I'm afraid to put any more down. And we'll just come and grab the front part of the arm instead. Take this model around so we can get up in there, all right.
Got a little bit of that bicep that pokes up underneath the shoulder pad up towards the pec area as it closes in. So just be careful and get a little bit of color up in there as well. I'll wipe off most of the paint on my brush so that I can go up into the shadow area, making sure that I'm not putting too much pigment up in there. Again, you know, every time you feel like, okay, I want to get a little bit of filter color in there, but not too much, just wipe it off, right? The less paint that's on the brush, the less that can go on the model. Never be afraid to play around with it. You'll notice a lot of times as I go, um, the more and more I paint in a particular area, the less paint that gets on the brush, I'll then take that brush that has much less pigment on it and go work another part of the model where I don't want a lot of pigment showing up shadow areas, things like that, right? If I notice I've got too much color coming off of the brush, it's covering up some of my shadow, then again, just wipe it off on your thumb. You don't always have to go back to your palette and readjust your color, right? Sometimes you can take care of it right here. Blend that back around into the shadows again. Up underneath that arm guard. Now we're starting to look pretty good. Right. So now we've got that dark flesh as it goes back underneath. Brighter on the outside here. Brighter on the tops of the muscles. And when I say brighter, we're not going for full brightness. we got other colors coming, guys, so don't get impatient. Painting thin requires the best patience in painting because every time you put a color on, we have that expectation that, oh, my God, you know, I was talking about it in a tutorial yesterday. One of the things that our, our mind gets set on as we go through life, especially when painting, is it think of some of the things you just paint just for no reason if you're not an artist what are the kinds of things people paint they paint walls in their house right um you paint uh shit i don't know that you paint anything else right does a normal person paint anything other than walls in their house maybe probably not but think about how you want to paint when you paint a wall in your house what do you want to have happen you want to put the roller or the brush in the paint and you want to go over to the wall and you want to pull that roller down the wall and you want it to cover everything <laughs> There's no time when painting a house that you want to have to do two layers because it's freaking boring, monotonous work. So our brains tend to be that instant gratification when it comes to things like this, even when we're painting a miniature. Even if you painted 5,000 miniatures in your life, most people that I know want the instant gratification of seeing the exact color they had in mind hit the model in the exact way they had it in mind when they run that first brush stroke across it. And the way that I paint, you have to reverse your, your teaching. You have to get into the mindset that I don't need to see the exact color the first time I put it on there. It's actually better not to see the exact color that I wanted put on the model, the exact thickness that I wanted it, because it gives you more control in the end. It allows you the control of layering thin layers up to get exactly the color you want where you want it, but not right next to it. Right. And so that when you put two colors next to each other, they blend seamlessly without a whole lot of fancy, you know, working wet or, um, you know, going back and mixing custom colors. Because as I'm blending, I can overlap colors. I can do all sorts of things and I can dictate and kind of drive in the right direction where paint is brighter and darker on the model as I go. So just get used to the fact that doing it this way, you're not going to get that instant gratification of, oh, my God. You know, when I put this flesh tone on, it looked kind of wonky. Yeah, it will. You know, sometimes your models, when you're working this way, won't look right until you get them done. But trust me, as soon as you get them done, you'll be like, oh, yeah, that had a big difference in the final product over what you were used to. Okay, again, just kind of brightening up some of the muscle tops, making sure that I keep these recesses, like here on the bicep dark. That's our muscle shadow there. Got kind of a thick vein on the top of his bicep. Either that or that's a mold line I didn't clean. We're going to go with thick vein. <laughs> going to come back to the other arm now. And brighten up those top muscle groups again just a little bit to keep them in line with the other arm. I'm always looking at how bright I go on one side versus the other. I don't want a lot of imbalance. I've gotten this over here to where it's a little bit brighter on his left arm than it is on the right. So I want to build up the right arm just a little bit before I move on to the legs. Or actually, before we move on to his left hand. I guess we haven't done his hand yet. I just want to get a little bit more paint on the very top of the shoulder here. Across the top of the bicep. And the forearm again. 
And that's up to you, right? There's just, as you work any color onto a model, whether it be flesh or you're doing cloth or armor or whatever, it doesn't matter what it is that you're painting. Just always take a step back after you apply a little bit of color and see how it exists on the model. What does it do to the colors around it? Does it make everything around it darker because you went so bright with a particular color? That happens a lot when we're doing our final highlights. You know, it happens a lot when we're working with whites, uh, bright grays, ivories, bright flesh tones especially, right? You start putting them on the model, you get cool color, but it affects every color around it. Right? That's just the way the eye translates value and hue when it sits right next to a differing color. Right? Sometimes it makes the other color disappear. You've seen those optical illusions that people post on the web where even though you can tell that it looks like there's two colors there, if you back out a little bit and look at it kind of sideways, you'll notice there's actually four colors, but the two in the middle get lost because the outside two are so much brighter that as they come closer together, it makes the middle two disappear. If you've ever seen stuff like that, as a kid that used to trip me out, I was like, how does that happen? It's magic. No, it's just the eye can't relate certain things. Right? It can't discern the differences in hue and value as too bright of a contrast gets created in front of it. So just remember, the same thing happens on your model. You put two really bright colors together, you're going to have the model start looking a little bit different with all of the dimmer colors, like say your dirty browns you were doing, uh, shadows on cloth, things like that. Hey, um, let me have one of those porno, porno magazines. Mag. What's going on, Armin? Sorry you're late. Did I announce that you're putting out a color list? It's already, it's been out on the site for weeks, man. The color list for this guy is on the site, in the store, under the miniature heading at slowfusegaming.com. You'll see the model. It's all sold out. Unfortunately, we don't have any more of the models, but the color list is right there in the description of the model himself. If you've got a particular question about it, I can go over it because I have them all sitting right in front of me. But yeah, it's all there on the web. Baron Samodi. Thank you so much, man. Glad you're finding it useful. Uh, did we finish the Infinity Nomads from the other week? Was hoping to see the work on the Black Rifles. I will be doing some Infinity Black Rifles coming up soon. Maybe next as early as next week. I can't guarantee that, but I will have some coming up. There's a hole and has a hole in his arm? Say what, Ray? He has a hole in his arm. Did you fill it? Uh, Armin's, what is this two brush blending is? Your, your old stomping grounds last week and somebody was talking about learning it at Gen Con. Two brush blending is, a, is a, a situation whereby you go and basically do what we're doing, but you do it with thicker paint. So you'd come in with one brush with uh, thicker paint on it and say paint the top of this muscle with it in one stroke and get tanned flesh on there. And then you have a second brush sitting by that has no paint on it at all and just water. And then you use that brush to feather the edges to give it that blended look. So if you were going to go between two colors, say we paint this flesh on here and then we want to go in with our highlight color, I'd take one brush that has the highlight color and I'd put a bright swath of highlight on there and then I'd grab my other brush that had water on it and use that to just feather the edges, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm creating a thin watered down layer between two colors by, you know, you know, kind of erasing or scrubbing the edge of the paint with the water brush. Uh, and then you just keep cleaning the brush that only has water on it so it doesn't have any pigment or very little pigment and just water. So you'd have two, right? So I would go in and I would paint, you know, some people do it with two brushes in their hand when they get really good at it. And you'd go in and you put a bright highlight down and then you'd switch over to just your water brush and, and blend that edge before the paint has a chance to dry. Um, and it, you know, it can work. It, well, it, I, I say it can work. It works wonders, right? Loads of, loads of people love to paint that way. Um, I didn't like it because I didn't enjoy the fact that going in with the, the thick paint first and getting that opaque color, again, put me in a situation where I felt like if you didn't make the right choice on the thickness of the paint that you put on the first time, you can go in with the, the, the second brush and you can blend that edge really neat and get a really cool feathered effect. But then when you go to put paint back over the other one, I feel like I'm building up too much material as I two brush blend. Um, and that's just, you know, I didn't like it when I first tried it, so I didn't work with it. Uh, I can do it very well. Um, but for me, it's just something where I, I don't feel like it's, uh, it's a style for me. I prefer doing it this way. I prefer building up from very thin layers so that every layer I put on is already feathering instantly as I do it. 
Um, that way, if I, if I misplace a color and look at it on the model and say, oh yeah, that's a little, that's not exactly where that bright spot needed to be, I can just simply come back with another thin layer of the coat of paint that was under it and put it on. I'm never building up a whole lot of material. Uh, both are very valid painting styles. Uh, there's a ton of miniature painters that use two brush blending as their method because it's, uh, you know, if you, if you learn that way as how to get your colors to blend, because with acrylics, we, we're in a wasteland of painters, right? There are those fine artists that don't think acrylic is even a paint worth using because it's not workable. You can't take acrylics without adding a bunch of medium to them and actually get them to work like oil. Oil I can blend all day long. I can come back and blend it tomorrow in some cases, um, you know, so I can activate, reactivate. Oil takes a long time to cure. Um, and that's what, you know, painters throughout the years have really loved about it. It gives you the flexibility and the control of being able to mix the paint on the palette or, or on the, the piece of work that you're doing. Obviously with miniatures, we can't work in oil. We need to be, you know, moving around the, the model too much. You can use, and some people do, don't get me wrong. Some people paint with oils and love it, um, but you're painting a lot and then you're putting it aside and not touching it for days before you come back to it. And a lot of times the instant gratification for us doesn't allow that to happen. Acrylics work really good for us, but they don't allow you to like actually blend color on the model. I can't like paint, you know, a little bit of uh, like, let's say we were going to do a fade from red to purple on his cloak. I can't paint that red on there and get all the red the way I want it, you know, nice and, and down and, and kind of halfway down the cloak, then wash my brush and then go load up with a bunch of purple and start painting the purple on the cloak. And then when I get to the middle, just assume that the purple and the red are going to blend because the red's already dry, right? So it doesn't do anything. Um, and so, you know, you have to then either go back and get more red and put red on and then go get purple real quick and blend them in the middle. And with acrylics, that never really looks very good. There are ways that you can do it and people have been doing it long enough that they get good at it like anything. Um, but acrylic just isn't, isn't friendly like that. It doesn't allow us to use it. So the two brush blend is kind of just another way of doing what I'm doing here. I just choose to paint everything super thin with that wet brush as opposed to ever going in with full pigmented paint. So hopefully that helps. I can show you, I can, when we're, when we're doing another model sometime in the next coming weeks, I'll, I'll do some two brush blending for you so you can actually see it in, in work. Uh, Ray Silver says, can we do the palette on one more time? You seem to be struggling intently with getting that kind of coverage with your paint that thin. It behaves more like a wash. Yeah, you're probably going too thin. Let's go back to the palette and show you what I'm doing. All right. So Ray is saying he's having a hard time getting his thin paint to cover the way mine is, right? So I'm painting very thin. Uh, this has been, I don't know, five, six layers of paint to get the skin tone to where we've got it right now on these two arms with the shading. It's all one color. Um, uh, anywhere where we see shade is just the black uh, primer spotting up through the thin paint. All right. So let's put another. I need another drop on the palette anyway because I was using this one. Let's do it over here so we can see. All right. So just put a drop of paint. Again, I'm using our Bombwick number one brush for what I'm doing here. Right. But you can use, you know, whatever. All right. Load it completely with water. Again, you know, as I come out of my cup, notice how much water is on my brush. I can, you know, paint my whole thumb wet with how much water is in the brush as I come out of the water cup. Right. And then I'm just going to come over here, pull a tail of paint out, start working it around. Get more water on your brush if you need to get that first puddle started. And there, that kind of looks good. And the goal is to be able to take your brush flat and push it on the palette. And as I push it, when I get to the end, all that pigment stays puddled up like that. See how it's not bleeding back out across the palette? Right? It stays in a droplet. Then when I grab that droplet and move it across over here, it stays in a droplet over here. It doesn't pool all the way back behind me. So I get this nice translucent paint behind that is what's going over our model. And every time I move more paint across, it's going to get darker. Not on this palette, obviously, because it's got a wax surface. But see, as I move that paint drop, notice how it doesn't just, you know, uh, spread out on the palette. And like I said before, if you're too wet, if I add more water into this and make it too thin, that's one more drop of water off the brush. Now, when I go across, watch what the drop does, right? It starts to blur a lot more. See how it's blurring and coming further over. And again, put more paint, pour, put more water in it. And you're going to still see it looks thin. It looks like it should work, but the key is as you move it, what it does, right? Notice how now it starts blurring even more. And eventually you get so wet that this just goes back in and it all becomes one color like it did down here. So that's really the key is to make sure that, you know, you pull a little bit more paint down each time. And as I push it over, it stays kind of dark enough for me to use over here in its pool and doesn't saturate back through the brush stroke that I made. So if you have to, as you're getting used to this, 
right? Uh, Uncle Touchy was here the other day uh, learning this as well, uh, live here in the studio. And uh, he was basically putting this and doing it all over his palette. Like every time he would go to the paint, he'd grab another little bit and put it over here. And he'd work it again so that he could get the feel for it. Because obviously, after you've done this enough, you can't tell, right? Like I just work off of the same spot and I'm just over here grabbing paint and going to the model. And it's always the same because I've been doing it for 50 million years. But if you need to, every time you go to the water palette or every time you go to your water jar, come back over to the palette, get a little bit more paint, move it over to another place on your palette and test it there, right? Just grab more paint and pull it over here so that you can still see how that brush stroke is working. Is the droplet working right? Do you have the right thinness? And by the time you're done, you're going to have 50 million of these spots on your palette where you've done this. And that's okay. As you're learning, you need to create those situations where your brain can respond and see and get that verification that what you're doing is right. If you try to do like I do, and you just sit here and work in the same spot, eventually you're gonna you're not gonna be able to see how much paint's coming off of there. And if you go back and add water every single time, eventually you're gonna overload this with water. There's just no way to beat it. So, you know, I'll add water, I'll go to the palette, I'll get it right, I'll paint with it, I'll clean it on my thumb. I'll, I'll maybe I'll go back to the palette once I've done it two or three times because now I don't need any more water, blah, 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 blah. But until you get the feel for it, because that has to do with how dry your climate is, yada, yada. I can't tell you that you can do three drops of water in your paint and then you can do five times in that you know, drop before you need to add more water. I can't tell you that because it's gonna be different for your house where you live. So just do this every time. Go over, get your paint wet, grab more paint, bring it over here on your palette and then you know, add or paint and water until you feel like you know, that's the way you need it, right? And just keep doing it. Every time you do it, do it someplace new on your palette. Yeah, it's a waste of palette paper, but while you're learning, that's that's worth it, right? Because as soon as you can get this down, your painting is going to go up tremendously. Oh, Armin's. No, 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 I didn't. Nope, nope. Like I said, probably not before the end of the day today, if not beginning of tomorrow. Sorry, I misunderstood you. Uh, could it be the rattle cam primer screwing up your lower layers of paint at that thinness, Ray? Probably not. I wouldn't see why. Well, and LT brings up a good point. One thing that we haven't mentioned is that I'm using a natural hair brush, whether it's this or whether it's a Winsor Newton, right? I'm using our Bombwick Kalinske Sables. Uh, it could be a Winsor Newton Sable. Uh, it could be a Raphael Sable. It could be a Da Vinci Sable. For what we're doing, you need a natural hair brush. I've said that a million times on stream. So if you're using, I know Ray has got our brushes. Um, so you shouldn't be having those problems. If you are trying at home to paint as thin as I do and you're having big problems with it, first check your brush, all right? I, and I apologize, I didn't mention that at the beginning of the stream, but we say it every day pretty much. Um, you need a, at least a red sable brush. It doesn't have to be Kalinsky, that's the top end of the sable brushes. Uh, it can be a red sable, it can even be a sable blend. You can do like a 90%, 10% synthetic blend. Um, it's 90% natural hair, 10% synthetic. They do that so it cuts the cost. It creates a brush that doesn't last very long, but it still does what we're doing here fairly well. You need the natural fibers in the brush because that's what's going to carry the brush load. It's going to soak the right amount of pigment and water. It's not gonna play with any. When you apply it, it applies it in smooth layers as opposed to a synthetic brush because each, if you can imagine under a microscope, each hair of a synthetic brush acts like a, a, a strand of plastic is the best way to describe it. It doesn't work like real hair does. Um, you know, it's the difference between a, a wig and real hair. You know, if you go up and you grab a wig, it may look real, but it feels not real, right? I mean, they can make them that feel pretty close, but if you get down right down to it, it's like, yeah, that's not real. Um, and that's the same thing with the, uh, the, the uh, synthetic brushes. Because they're basically a line of plastic as opposed to a line of hair, when they go through paint, they split the paint and you get like this weird traction with a synthetic brush that splits the paint apart and you see your paint strokes a lot differently. Whereas a synthetic tends to really blend the paint as it puts it on. I'm not saying that you can't still screw your stroke up if you have a real heavy hand, but if you paint you know, with a medium to light stroke, then the paint is going to just basically flow onto the model a lot differently and a lot smoother. With a, with a natural fiber brush. So always be working with a natural fiber brush when you paint thin like this. Uh, that's really the reason why we came out with the bomb wicks because it gives you the opportunity to get, you know, here's a, here's a plug, you know, for 33 bucks, 32.99, you get five, uh, you know, uh, Kalinsky Sable brushes and I think they work a champ, so. <laughs> Boobs are the same way. Afflicted. Uh, what am I using for a palette again? Afflicted, I'm just using palette paper. It's literally just uh, the palette paper that I use is this stuff. 
Master's Touch Fine Art Studio 9 by 12 paper palette, 40 sheets for oil, acrylic, watercolor, disposable for easy cleanup, smooth, poly coated surface, 9 inch by 12 inches, however many centimeters that is. Uh, that's what I use. <laughs> Just cheap palette paper. Snake man, good. We'll see you back in a bit. Apparently you have to go buy some palette paper as you're using a weld palette, a weld palette and have nowhere to really do that from. Um, well, you can still do it there. You know, uh, it's, it's going to be a little bit different for you, obviously, right? On how you figure out how thin you are. Yeah, I don't like those little weld palettes um, I, because it's hard for me to... I, I tend to want to mix right around the blob of paint, right? So if I was to bring another color in here, I'd put another color right next to this drop and I would blend them in between. And with those weld palettes, you can't. You have to take a little bit and put it in the other cup and mix them to, like that. And so it just is a hassle. A lot of people love them again. It's just, you know, there's as many ways to paint as there are painters. And I just have got my own quirks. I don't like the little, you know, the little round palettes that have the little dimples in them where you put your paint in the dimple and all. They work great for like watercolor and stuff, but for this kind of painting, they don't work at all. Having to transfer paint from one to another, not being able to blend right there and add paint as you need on the fly, I mean, it just drives me nuts. He used Rhino liner to prime his models. Hopefully not, Hairdo. Hopefully not. <laughs> Yep, and Uncle Touchy says it. He says he can vouch for that. It's, it, he couldn't do these kinds of effects that we're doing with painting thin and with glazing, as we call it, and all of that until I literally told him to stop painting with synthetic brushes. Like, he got some Winsor Newtons in his hand and his whole painting, you know, style, like he immediately sent me a message when he got home with them and started painting. He's like, these are just completely different. And they are completely different. Now, better or worse is not a question different and allowing you different techniques is why there are natural hair brushes and synthetic brushes i would not use natural hair brushes to base coat tanks i would use synthetic brushes because there's no need for the natural hair brush and the natural hair brush that you base tanks with will cost you 50 bucks because the more sable you have the more expensive it gets so you know a number i can't even imagine like you know this if it were a kalinsky sable with that much hair in it compared to what we use in ours you know this brush would be like 50 bucks you know, so use a synthetic. This is 100% synthetic right here, right? And it'll put paint on just fine if you're just trying to do broad strokes and base coating. You're not trying for any effect. You're just trying to get a lot of, of paint on a surface. That's fine. Um, but for these kind of details, things that we're doing in miniature, you have to have a natural hairbrush. And again, that's, that's why we made the bomb wick. So you didn't have to go drop 100 bucks for three brushes and still get some really good Kalinsky sables. My Lord Megatron, you missed what? Could I repeat it one more time? Repeat what? I don't even know. I've said like 80 million things. Nice, Afflicted. LT, maybe use the Rhino Liner on the bases. I don't even know what Rhino Liner would do on a small surface like that, right? I feel like the problem with the Rhino Liner paint is that it peels at the edges really bad. <laughs> that might be really hardcore. Assassin, when you're starting to paint skin on a model that's entirely skin, what's the best way to start painting? Should you use darker color pigments or lighter pigments? Darker, the way I do it, I go darker first. Oh, for the, <laughs> for the speed read of the product info. I did that all in one breath. Ray, don't know. First layer of paint over black always behaves really funny after that. It's a lot easier to glaze. Maybe just you have a heavy hand. Yeah, if you have a heavy painting hand, the first layer is going to streak and do all sorts of weird things, but that's okay. That's one of the things that painting thin like we're doing does. I, I zoomed in and showed you that mine was exactly the same. It was cloudy, streaky, didn't look quite right. You know, that's fine. Um, you know, it, you're not trying to get the perfect color on in one stroke. Right? As a matter of fact, I'm going back in underneath his arm here because I can see an area where the paint didn't load properly in the shadow there. And I can go back over that right? because of exactly what we're talking about. It's a little funky looking down there. So let's go ahead and a little bit more paint. Right? But that's what I mean by giving you control. It allows you to dictate how paint sits on the model over layer and layer and layer of application. Right? So like right now, let's go back and let's start in on the neck, right? I feel like we're 
getting some good momentum here if we or if we need to get some good momentum here so i'll start painting the neck and look how immediately not much pigment on there at all Let's see if i can zoom in and how close i can get before we lose focus all right so if i come in here and start putting it on there you'll notice there's not much paint looking like it's actually sticking right looks like crap more black showing through than anything else but that's okay because what we're trying to do is tint the black right now that's all we're doing we're tinting that base layer we're just making the black not black we're making the black look kind of you know skin tone that looks horrible that's fine it's perfectly fine because what's happened is that there is no more pure black now on his neck all of the black is some color of flesh tone based on how much of that actually stuck now you don't want to do it so loose that you just build up you know pools and pools of paint on here you want to be able to keep it smooth enough to where you don't uh you know you don't want like a wash you don't want a whole bunch of skin tone piling up you know in a particular area so you still want it to be fairly thin but now notice as I go back, I still haven't gone back to the palette. It's still the same brush load of paint, but now I'm just attacking some of these areas more. Going for the areas that pop out a little bit more on his throat, like right around his Adam's apple here. And then right down below as it travels down towards the clavicle, get a little bit of highlight there. Right? And now we start picking up to where we can see how we're gonna get highlight in there. back again start getting the middle of the throat along the Adam's apple this side of the neck muscle that goes up to the outside of the neck same thing on this side these sculpts are amazing they give us a lot of detail in the muscle without being you know heroic overly crazy right they just give us good natural dimension so we can follow that along and just catch those peaks of the muscles and remember, that first layer of paint looked like absolute ass. I'm not going to lie. When you're painting thin, the first layer of paint, more times than not, will look like absolute ass if you're trying to put a light color over a dark color. Because we always prime black, that means about 99.9% .9 of the time, first layer is going to look like ass. Because we're putting light colors. Imagine if we're painting yellow, orange, you know, greens, anything. You put it over black, and the black is going to win the day on that first layer. But now look, as we go subsequent layers, right? Now we're starting to get it to do something. Less black showing through, more of our skin tone showing through, not as sloppy, still maintaining good color. Right? And so there we've gone from where that first coat, you know, looks like ass into where now it's something that's at least workable, right? We can stare at that and we can be like, okay, I can see exactly what I'm gonna do with that. Got a little bit of spot here where it looks like I've got that remnants of a mold line right on his bicep that I need to get. So we lose that black right there. Like so. You can see over here, right? As we get in close on the camera, notice how the top of his shoulder right, doesn't blend quite as well going down. Get a little bit of rough edge right there. So we can just kind of take this very, very thin skin tone and smooth some of that out. We're nitpicking at this point because I got you zoomed in to like, you know, pimple on a porn star's level. We're not really concerned with all of that right now. All right. Starting to look good. Let's get his knees. And I do have a very light hand when painting. That's something that's hard to teach if I'm not sitting right next to you. Right, because I can't see how your mo how your brush is bending on the model. You know, when I'm painting, you'll notice there's not a lot of flex in the bristles on the model. You know, if I were to come in and and you know, if we zoom in and I use my standard brush stroke here as I go through, you know, it's about like this. So it's just the tip of the brush is flexing. Right, I'm not doing this. Right. So I don't paint this way. So if you find yourself bending your, your brush over 90 degrees or even 45 degrees like this to the point where the hairs are splitting on the end like that, then you got too heavy a hand, my opinion, right? I feel like that's not the way you need to paint in order to number one, get good paint application and number two, keep your brushes lasting long. So there you go. Valkyrie, what's going on? The Twitch Prime sub from Snotrash. Thank you so much, my friend. Two months in a row with that Prime. Thank you for choosing to use that on us. 
Much appreciated. Yeah, right? Is that the big one? Number 10? Yeah. That's like all the money. Good brushes. And if you paint large canvases and you want Kalinsky sables, you got to have a lot of money. They're not cheap. Nicholas, you just got home and paint along with the bot. It will be there. It will be there. Uh, are the brush from Games and Gears okay for this? Also, what about the Army Painter brushes? JDA, uh, the Army Painter sables are red sable brushes, and they work just fine. Um, so they'd be good. Uh, the Games and Gears brushes, we've used the Games and Gears brushes, and I'll be honest with you. Um, a very honest review about those brushes is that while I am a huge fan of this travel case, okay? Right, so I've got the Lester Bursley ones, the signature series that they did for Les, right? And while I love the idea of these travel cases, I love them, I love them, I love them, these brushes are pretty garbage. Um, I've had to clean them excessively in order to maintain, you know, even a little bit of a point. And, I mean, this guy will still point okay. For a, This is a number one, so it's more like a traditional round sizing, right? It's a lot bigger. Like, our number one is a lot smaller than that, right? You can see ours is on the right. So it's a much more traditional. So, you know, uh, I feel like I feel like it's not what I want from a Kalinske Sable. The Windsor Newtons hold their points lots longer, have a lot more springiness to them than these do, uh, and don't, you know, square off as easy. I feel like the, the games and gears have given me a lot of fits as far as cleaning and splitting. I don't know if it's because of this ferrule. They have a custom ferrule that they've had to make for these these really cool kit. I love the whole package, man. I, I wish that I liked them a lot more. Um, but it's very, very difficult, it seems, to get the ferrule clean. Um, and I don't know why. I don't know if it's just because of the shape that it, you know, it's tough to, when I work with the soap, it doesn't seem like as much paint comes out of the ferrule mouth here as, as not. They're built really well. I, I wish I could say better things about them. They're just not something that I am a huge fan of. They may be better now. I don't know. That's why we chose to make traditional ones. We talked to Games and Gears at Adepticon, and we're thinking about doing some brushes with them. I just, something holds me back, so. Lately, what's going on? Too British to quittish. Good advice on the brushes. What about other tools? Are there brands to avoid or any that are particularly good? No name brand versus big name, etc. Um, I mean, as far as brushes go, the I, I feel like, well, we just talked about two, uh, the Red Sables from, which are called the Army Painter Wargamer brushes, um, are very good. They don't last a real long time, but they're good brushes. And I know that might sound funny. Um, the They're these, right? The, uh, the Wargamer series, like here's what they call their character brush. Um, I like the handle. I like the triangle wood handle on the Army Painter stuff. The ferrule is pretty good. I've had a couple of them come loose, but not bad. Um, I find that they're just, because they're a little lesser quality sable, they will tend to split on you. You'll find yourself cleaning them a little bit more. Um, but for detail and for price, it can't be beat. These are awesome. Uh, we sell them on the store. Um, and then we've got, I mean, on the store, we sell the Army Painter, which are great. Uh, and then we sell ours, which I feel like are better than the Army Painter. And, but not the same quality as a, as a Windsor Newton Series 7. And then we sell the Series 7s, which I don't even know that I have any Series well, 7s out here to show you. Do yeah, there's a Series 7, right? And, and we sell the Series 7s on the, on the store as well. So for me, Wrath of Taz, thank you so much for the sub. Two months from Wrath. Um, uh, for me, this is, this is kind of the, the, the holy trinity of brushes. Um, if, if you are trying to spread your... Uh, you know, your kind of good, better, best quality is kind of judge them by this. The Army Painter, very, very good quality for a very, very low price. I think each brush is probably in the neighborhood of like seven to nine bucks. Um, ours actually net out cheaper than that. I hate to, I hate to brag, but I mean, ours net out when you buy the set of five um, as a set, we can afford to give them to you less. So that's like $32.99 for five brushes to so do the math. It's like $6.50 a brush or something like that. So ours are actually cheaper. Ours are Kalinsky Sable, they're better quality. Um, but it, that's, you know, that's, that's probably going to come down to you being an opinion on what you can get locally. You know, if you, if it, you know, costs you a ton to ship from us, then I think that, you know, that's going to be a choice. The Winsor Newton Series 7 are the best Kalinsky Sable brushes I've ever used in my years of painting. Um, they last, they're very, very good quality, uh, stainless steel ferrules on most of them. Uh, just really, really, really good brushes. We tried to mimic as much as we can from the Series 7s when we made ours. 
they just use some processes that we can't do, otherwise our brushes cost exactly like theirs do. And that's not where I wanted to be. I wanted to be lower cost brush, uh, similar functionality, so that you had you could keep a Series 7 number one and a number two that you like to paint with, and then you could run like our brushes as your beat em up brushes, because you don't feel as bad if after six months they start to split because you've just used them on every single model every single day. Um, because it's 30 bucks for a whole set of five as opposed to 30 bucks for two brushes. So that's where we tried to sit in. Um, the Raphael's are really good. The Da Vinci's are really good. All natural hair brushes that I've found generally are, are very good. You just have to take care of them. And it's just where on the spectrum of care are they? A Winsor Newton, you can beat the shit out of it for longer, I feel like. Um, and then like ours are kind of middle of the road where you're going to have to clean them. You know, probably I would say once a week, go through and clean your brushes on ours. I've used my Winsor Newtons and I've failed to clean them for like a month before they start giving me problems. Um, you know, but I feel like if you take care of any of these brushes, Army Painter, Da Vinci, Raphael, ours, Series 7, if you take care of them, they'll last you a long, long time. So, brushes are confusing, right? Because uh, really, the good brush is the one you have in front of you that does the job. You know, for me, I just need to, you need to have some natural hair brushes in order to do the kind of painting that you're really going to want to grow into in miniature painting. Whether it's my style or somebody else's style, you see, synthetic brushes are not going to get you there. Uh, when do I apply? <laughs> Hairdo says, when do you apply the Reichland Flesh Shade? Uh, hashtag never. <laughs> Ray Silver. Well, that answer is that you're going back to the palette every time. Yeah. Oh, does he have ears that are also skin tone on here? I don't think so. I think his ears are covered up by face plate stuff. Ugg will have to tell us, but I'm pretty sure that he's got his ears are all covered up by the face plate. No ears. No ears, no face, all behind the mask, right? All behind the mask. So next is his knees and feet. One leg has a, uh, a shin guard and the other one has nothing. We got to do his hand here first too. I forgot about his left hand. All great questions, guys. Keep them coming. We do need to get some painting done though. Helmet's open for the ears. Yours isn't, though. Bob's your uncle. What's up, old nerd? Wait a minute. I'm the old nerd? Damn. <laughs> What's happening, Bob's? How the hell you been? Socrates, will I be at Adepticon? I will be at Adepticon. Should you always clean brushes with soap after every use? Don't want to ruin the bomb wicks. Um, you definitely can clean them after every use. Make sure that you're not using, uh, you know, something that has an astringent in it or alcohol base or anything like that. All natural, no nonsense uh, brush soap is the best. The Winsor Newton uh, brush soap, the liquid brush soap is fantastic. The Masters brush soap is fantastic. Um, you see us use the Masters on here. We're out. We carry the Winsors in the store, but it's out. They've been out of stock for like a month now, so I have a hard time getting it. Um, but yeah, you definitely can. Um, just be careful as you're washing them not to, you know, flex the bristles too much, things like that, because you will wear the brush out over time. But yeah, there's no reason why you can't wash them all the time. Do not use mineral spirits. Do not use white spirits, whatever they're called for oil cleaning. Don't use them. Um, there's no reason why you can't, but they're hard on the brushes and there's no need for it because they don't clean up acrylic. You, you know, you want a, you know, a natural water-based soap, right? You don't need anything with fancy cleaners or, you know, alcohols or anything like that in it. All right, let's get this hand. Time for glasses. Glasses on head, glasses on head. Again, just building up the tan flesh, making sure I don't allow too much of the pigment to go between the fingers. Um, between the fingers will be the darkest spot, uh, kind of like a wash. When you work this thin, sometimes the paint will want to run, you know, down into the nooks and crannies. Just make sure you get the pigment out of there. Just take your brush and try to remove as much from in between the fingers as you can if that happens. Yo, 
what this weapon is called. Somebody out there tell me what this weapon is called? It's like a Fessel or Fess... Fessies... I don't remember. Forget what this damn thing's called. It's a big bundle of sticks with an axe head tied into it. Is what it is. Forget what the name of it is, though. As I'm sitting here staring at it. I can't imagine. Like, this guy's walking around with it with, in one hand. I wouldn't want to fight this guy. Right? You got, you're basically carrying a bunch of tree branches tied around an axe head. Right? That he it looks like he could barely get his hand around, and yet he's holding it in one hand. I don't know that I'd really want to... Uh... Is it Ebonflow? I think so, right? The word does... I think it does sound like fascist. But it has no political connotation. The weapon, obviously. He's got leather strapping on his hand from where the... Uh, his uh, forearm guard attaches. Comes around on the back, too. Build up a little bit more on the top of the hand here. So, remembering to leave the in-between of the fingers with as little pain as we can. We want as much of that black primer to show through our flesh tone in between the fingers. So I'll highlight the fingers themselves again. Top of the hand again. Fasces was a symbol of power. Oh, was it? Okay, cool. And unity. Oh, LT, it's actually the axe is the axe is actually on like this center piece here, maybe. And then the bundle is just wrapped around it. That makes sense. So it's a regular axe, it just has a bunch of sticks wrapped around it with leather. Is there a, a purpose in combat for that? Does it strengthen the haft of the axe? I mean, I guess from a mechanical engineering standpoint, it could go either way, right? I guess you're not hitting people with the bundle of sticks, is the point. It just seems funny to create such a broad handle for an axe if it doesn't have some sort of other head bashing feature that it's meant for. Symbol of office. Well, this guy, it's for breaking skulls. I'm pretty sure. All right, let's keep working. Knees now. Start moving quicker. You guys get the drift. You've been watching. So we're just going to start covering the legs. The leg, uh, the right leg here has got a shin guard and then leather straps on the back. Don't feel bad if you get, you know, your skin tone on the leather straps. More power to you if you can keep from getting over paint on your details. But, you know, and at this point, I'm focused on skin. I'm, I'm not as focused on everything around it. I would be more so if we had done a pre-highlight because I would not want to interrupt the pre-highlight on, say, you know, the metallic pieces or anything like that if I could avoid it. But because we don't, I'm just kind of going through with some fairly loose brush strokes to get paint on the model straight away. Like before, we just want to work on getting a good first coat. That's all skirt. Yep. 
underneath the knee again like we did on the shadows of the arms we want to make sure we get a good tint of flesh tone even in the shadowed areas we don't want anything to stay black primer that's the only kind of no-no that i'll tell you on every model you need to be watching out for don't let yourself get to the point where you're like oh that shadow looks so good in there i'll just leave it black primer See, I've been beating the crap out of my brush today already. Speaking of needing a cleaning. Since we got the brushes in, I've literally been painting like 24-7. That's a lie. I don't paint 24-7. Feels like it sometimes. Again, just kind of trying to catch the top of the muscle groups, top of the knee here, brighten it up a little bit, but not pushing paint up into the, the fold where the, the robe comes across. You want a little bit of darker flesh right across the top. So just focusing on that knee, a little bit on these muscle groups down here on the inner thigh, comes into the knee. Not too much again, don't want to over brighten that. And you can let it get a little dark over here on the right side as it pushes up underneath the robe again, like that that dimple in the side of your knee. Okay, we've got that shadow of the muscles a little too dark right there, so I'm just gonna load it up a little bit and push paint away from it. Okay. Got a lot more legs showing over here because it's straight. Again, just loose strokes to get coverage. Making sure I'm not too splotchy. Not letting paint build up anywhere. Push that all the way up into the shadows. Across the knee. Again, you saw me knock off nearly all the paint off my brush before going in on the leg again because rather than mix a darker color on the palette, just take most of the paint off so that a lot of your black primer shows through. Wiping off most of the pigment as I come out of the palette onto my thumb, make certain that I don't overpower the black on the inside of the leg here and I keep it nice and in shadow. Good. You can hear Bella out there snoring. Jen's out of town. Bella's like laying in the hallway, just snoring away. Drunken sailor style. Long night of carousing. She sleeps like she's been out partying. She sleeps like that all the time. But that must be the greatest. Sleep like the dead just by plopping your ass down in the hall. She's sleeping on the tile. Like it's the last sleep she'll ever need. So jealous. So jealous. Okay. Now, like I said, this leg over here, his left leg does not have a shin guard. So we're just gonna have to go in between all of lay straps which I don't know that I can even see them all question mark 
we're gonna go with yes. We're just gonna <laughs> may just throw a flesh tone all over this whole leg, let it sort itself out later. Can't really see the the leather straps. This is where this is where heroic scale miniatures come in handy is for things like this when you've got you know thin leather strapping that holds a, a sandal on a Roman gladiator and you're like I can't find the leather until I've got paint on it. <laughs> it's okay. We're fine if we get paint on it. We'll continue on as if nothing happened. Pay no attention. Before I took Jen to the airport yesterday, um, we busted out and grabbed some food for her. Went to a salad joint that we like here. Had a good salad, sitting around talking. At one point in time, I went, you know, to take a bite of my salad or something and was holding the bowl or whatever I was doing. Went to wipe my hands with a napkin and I had had flesh tones. We had done a, uh, a tutorial yesterday and I had flesh tones all over my damn hand on my thumb. And it was one of those where out of the corner of your eye, it looked like it looked like not flesh tone. It looked like something really crappy on your hand. But I'm bump. And I was like, what the? Freaked me out. <laughs> Moral of the story, always wash hands. I had washed my hands actually. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to find the the spots in the leather strapping, but I may just wind up getting paint all over everything. We're just gonna go for it and see. The straps don't have any kind of symmetry to them. It's literally like I did this, like I tied these sandals. I feel like if I had these leather strap sandals, this is exactly how I would tie them. All over the freaking place. No rhyme or reason. There's just leather straps going left and right. No reasoning behind it. See now, I'm starting to wonder, does he have? Well, huzzah, huzzah. I'll just throw back my legs and pollute my can't tell. with delight. Heridu, thank you so much for the sub. I can't tell if he's got, like, it does no, he doesn't. Okay, he doesn't. Judging on the front of the artwork, he doesn't have, like, a... A deal on that leg. He just is a leather strap right down the center is what I'm seeing. All right. All right. We're good. Scared me for a second. I was like, couldn't tell if the model had a, a shin guard on that side or not for a second. But no, he just has like, there is one heavy strip of leather like right down the middle there. That's way too much paint fuse. Gotta make sure we get enough skin tone up inside these areas that we can make do later on. Dude, I don't know that I would have wanted to like fight in sandals. Even with ones tight as well as this guy's. I'm not sure. But if you turned me loose in the arena, I'd have been worth a damn. I can hold my own in a scrap, but in sandals? Really? It takes it to a whole nother level, doesn't it? Go ahead and start bringing some lightness up onto the thigh there. Again, allowing the shadow to be at the top side here on the legs. Right, you gotta look at every part of the model. Normally we would be looking at the top side of say the arm being brighter, down here not so much because we've got the skirt, we've got the shadow from the hand and the weapon and all of that. So we're gonna run our shadow up. So we want our darkest brown to be at the hemline up top as opposed to down low. So we'll kind of leave it like that for now. All right, just keep pushing color in here. Why don't you donate $5 to the cause and maybe it'll make you feel better. Thank you, thank you, who that? Afflicted with 10 bucks. Thank you, Afflicted. 
Mucho appreciado, sir. So if you use Adepticon will be my first convention. You'll have to stop by and meet me. Socrates, that'd be awesome, man. That will definitely be and awesome. We try to make ourselves available for as much of the show as possible. I don't know. Jen might even come Happy with us this next year. That's our hope. Well, cheers. It would be nice to have Jen at the show as well. Bobs, am I still being terrible at Fractured Space? When was I ever terrible at Fractured Space? I was good at that game. I'm still good at that game. I have a... So, and after 10 PvP... They wiped my... Bob's talking about a game, a video game I really like called Fractured Space. He must see me my Steam account and notice that I've been playing it. So... I just started PvP, right? Because my accounts got reset to zero. They wiped everybody's accounts since I played last, which was a year and a half ago-ish. I was a founder for them. I gave a bunch of those games away in the stream at one point in time. But I started playing again, and I just got into PvP, and I've, I've got like a 78% win rate so far in PvP. I'm doing pretty good. I really dig that game. If there's any way I can support that game and make sure it stays alive, I will. It's an amazing game. They've really fine-tuned it. I'm digging the hell out of it. The matchmaker kind of sucks because the community that's playing it is so low because they're still technically calling themselves in beta. But if they get out of beta and actually advertise the damn thing, I think they do really well. You only use that Obtong 502 gel after cleaning with soap, or can you use it? Or can you use after use if brush is not dirty? So if you use... Oh, Afflicted, you can use the, the magic brush gel from Obtolong that we sell. You don't have to use it after cleaning. That's just when it works the best. Because in process, we think of it as we're cleaning the brush and we're putting it away. The, if you, at the end of your day, you've washed your brush off, you've got it nice, it comes to a clean tip, you know, after you've painted for a day, you don't have a lot of paint gummed up down in the... Which is a bad example. Mine's got tons of paint in the ferrule here already. I work my fingernail on here, we'll probably get a donut of paint out of the ferrule on my brush. I've got flesh tone galore already sinking into the ferrule, which I have told you guys a million times, that's the problem with brushes, not the tip. It's the, the body of the brush as it goes into the ferrule that causes you all your problems. Um, but let's say you clean it, you know, just like that. You don't use any soap. Yeah, you can dip it in the magic brush gel and leave it overnight. Just repoint it, you know? After you put it in the magic brush gel, repoint it. Um, I typically tell you if you can to either store it horizontally or with a slight angle down. Uh, we just got done designing the new brush holders for the new paint racks and the modular racks. I haven't spoken to you guys about that, but all of them will be sideways kind of sword rack style brush holders, which is really good. And you just put the, the brush gel on that and make sure your tip is straight. And then when you come in and start painting with it the next day, it'll be great. Guardian of the Realm, what's going on, man? Welcome back. Always scrub the thumb palette. I do. It's just the paint doesn't come off all the time. I wash my hands, but you know, like when you're going out to dinner and stuff, you just go and you wash your hands. Na, 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 na. Wash my hands, dry my hands, go off, and then you forget. Because, I mean, like that, you know, when you got flesh tone on your hands, you just wash your hands. Got things in my mind. I go, hey, I gotta do this, gotta do that. It's just the feel. You do it by feel, and it's like I don't really notice. So I'll go out and I'll be like, ah! Looks like I, you know, shoved my thumb up my butt because I got you know, crap colored paint all over my hand. <laughs> yeah, no, I wash my hands every time I get done painting. It's just for some reason, I have always had like a problem with focusing on the back of my thumb to get the paint off until I go to bed. When I go to bed, I sit there and I scrub it and I get it off or you peel the whole layer off and yell as it pulls your thumb hair out and all that crap. But when I'm just in a hurry, I just never just wash your hands. Camo Specs, this is the first time you've actually painted while we were streaming? You usually intend to and end up just watching? Nice. Nice. Battlestar Shogun, great name, using that Twitch Prime sub. Thank you, my friend. Thank you for coming in. Captain Chaos, also with the host. Thank you, my friend. Ray, uh, sandals are great for getting tangled in lion's mouths. Is that what they're for? I feel like that's not a good thing. Is that not flash you left on the front of the weapon? Looking at the art, it's not th on the front of the weapon? Flash on the front of the weapon. Oh, these things? Well, it had one on the front and it had one on the back. Is that not part of it? I thought it was kind of weird, but I left them. If those are parts of the sprue, I'll clip them off. Somebody tell me. Because I, you know, when I looked at it, it looked like all the sticks were bundled around a central rod, so I left it on there. And when I looked online, I saw some that had rods protruding out of them in the picture. So somebody let me know if that's not. I'll clip it off if it's just sprue. But it had it at both ends, and they weren't, 
it wasn't connected to the sprue at both ends, so I figured that was the way it was supposed to be. Because it wasn't connected straight to the sprue this way. It was connected, like, from the bottom at an angle. And this thing was part of the sculpt. So even though it's not in the picture, I figured that was part of it. But something, like, yeah... Uglove says it is meant to be there. All right, cool. I, I tried real hard to look at the model and say, okay, this looks like it was modeled on for purpose, so I, I left them. I went to the trouble to, to file it down because it the sprue did connect to this one, but not this one. So I left it. Good. Bingo. If you cut yours off, don't worry about it. <laughs> if you cut yours off, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. Sir Lathan, is there a way to see that tutorial? Which, which tutorial, Sir Lathan? Killing time painting. I can use a gardener brush, a plastic bristle. I have one. I have a, it's like a fingernail brush. I have one. I have one. It's not a matter of not wanting to get it off my thumb. It's that, like, you know, generally what happens, I'll tell you what happens, is that I'm sitting here painting. Jen gets home. We finish up the stream, or maybe I'm painting when there's not a stream, and I'm just painting, 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 painting. And she goes, hey, you want to go eat? And I'll be like, yeah, sure. Give me 15 minutes. And I'm painting, 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 painting. And then she comes in and goes, hey. You want to go eat? And I'm like, yeah, give me 15 minutes. She goes, you said that 30 minutes ago. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. let's go. And I'll, I'll clean up everything real quick. And I'll, you know, in a fit of rush, and I'll run in there, and I'll wash my hands, and then we'll go eat. That's why my thumb has paint on it. Don't think I'm just a dirty, I am a dirty boy, but just, you know, it's not like I'm just a grimy kid, you know? I do wash my hands. It's just that the way my life goes is generally when I'm exiting the house, it's under situations like that. I don't normally just leisurely have the, you know, hey, you want to go eat? Yeah, let's take 30 minutes to get ready. I'm usually like, ah, all the way to the restaurant. So, <laughs> Dirty, dirty little thing. <laughs> exactly. The flesh tones one and that paint on your hand happens all the time. Exactly, sir, Lathan. Um, the flesh tones tutorial. What we're doing, I mean, we're doing this. The tutorial that I spoke about with regards to flesh tones yesterday is a tutorial that was a private one-on-one. -on -one, so those are not available for everybody as of yet. Um, I'm planning on making them available for the people that take the tutorial, the one-on-one -on -one time from the site. You can, you can go to slowfusegaming.com and there is a, a product there called one-on-one -on -one, and you can book our two hour, uh, up to, well, you can only book up to two hour blocks. We can book a whole day of like four hours of one-on-one -on -one paint time. If you have a project you're working on, we get a lot of customers that do that. A lot of viewers will book time with me. Uh, I think they would all tell you the same thing. It's, it's really worth it if you have something specific you're trying to get accomplished that might be giving you troubles or that you really want to learn. It gives me the opportunity to really sit down and focus on exactly where and what you're painting with the skill set that you, you know, are comfortable with. As opposed to, I mean, I hate to call our normal streams like this generic. They're not generic. These are all good things that, you know, everybody can use. But I, I can't tailor to, you know, each of 150 people in stream you know, what it is that you're trying to get accomplished with your painting every day. As many as the questions as we try to answer, obviously we're going to, we're going to miss from time to time. You know, somebody might be out there and, and be like, oh man, that I, I understand what he's saying, but that doesn't help me in my situation. And so the, the one-on-one -on -one tutorial time allows me to do that. But unfortunately we don't have a way to like capture that and show it to everybody. And I don't know that I would anyway. I think we'd probably leave it exclusive for the people that, you know, had bought the time. But we're trying to do that. We're trying to archive those tutorials. We're trying to find new ways to archive stuff off of Twitch so that because Twitch tends to delete it. Uh, we just had a bunch of people today asking about a particular set of tutorials. And I was like, yeah, those aren't around anymore. And I'm a bad person and don't have them archived. So trust me, we're trying to come up with new ways to do all that so that this content doesn't just slip into the ether as Twitch decides that, you know, hey, we don't have hard drive space for you guys anymore. But that takes time and uh which is the biggest investment i don't have to do with things right now unfortunately time for video editing time for figuring out local or cloud storage for all of that kind of stuff is is eluding me but i am thinking about it constantly uh, we've got the new paint racks uh a lot of people have been asking i know somebody asked at the beginning of the show any updates on the paint racks yes Hopefully by uh, mid this week is what I was told. Uh, mid this week to me means tomorrow, but I don't know if that's the case. It might be Thursday. Um, we'll see. I'm going to go and uh, talk with him tomorrow or talk with him after the stream tonight and see if we can't get that timeline stepped up so that I can you know, reach out to everybody that has been kind enough to say they want paint racks from the store, the ones that we're manufacturing. I got all your emails. I did not answer everybody back one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Obviously, that would take me forever. Um, but we did get your pre-orders or your request, pre-requests, I guess. We don't really take pre-orders. Um, 
and hopefully I'll have good news for us tomorrow. Obviously at the stream time, I'll let you know if you haven't heard from me via e mass email prior to that. I'm hoping that you know we'll get good news. And part of that good news I'm hoping is that I'll be able to show you guys the prototype of the secondary racks. We've got a shelving unit that is a modular shelving unit to go with the paint racks. That modular shelving unit will include the, um, the GW paint pot rack. It's not really a paint pot rack for the GW stuff. It's I basically it. a shelving solution for everything other than uh, the uh, dropper bottles, right? So if you have other paints, P3 paints, um, you know, GW paints, whatever it is that you've got that you use other than the Vallejo Reaper Army Painter style bottles, uh, we will have a shelving system that contains that and allows you to do two shelves with up to 24 non-dropper bottles per shelf, or you can just use them as shelves for models, all sorts of stuff. So that design is done and just in need of prototyping. And hopefully I'll have the prototypes, you know, also. I would like to get those by tomorrow, but I can't promise anything. You guys will be the first to know once we do have them, because I'll show you on stream. Assuming it all works. If I put together the prototype and the prototype is garbage and doesn't work, then you probably won't see it. I do have a little bit of pride. I'll just keep telling you, nope, haven't had the prototype back yet until the second prototype comes in, and then I'll then I'll show you the second prototype where it actually works. I think I'm I'm pretty good at the mechanical engineering thing, knock wood, so I feel like they'll be okay, but I don't make any promises. I don't make any promises. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. OBS has a record while streaming option, does it not? You still have to put it someplace, KTP. Three hours of 1080p recording has to have hard drive space. Like lots. If I was going to record, like literally, we've got, you know, a year and a half worth of three hours a day, four days a week. You want to buy me that many terabytes? <laughs> Because you see the dilemma. The dilemma is like every week I eat up so much hard drive space just by recording the tutorials and the shows that we do that then I have to take the time to sit down and edit those and place them someplace so they don't take up as much space. And it's that time I don't have. It's very easy to hit the record button, but after so many streams, I'd run out of record space and then I just either start overlapping and overriding product and I don't want to do that either. So right now it's very tough. Sir Lathan, can I go over the things that we sell in the store? Brushes, cleaners. We sell all sorts of stuff. We sell all the paints you see us use. So we sell Model Air, uh, Army Painter, um, the game color paints, some model color paints. Uh, we sell brushes from Windsor Newton, Army Painter, our own brand of brushes, the bomb wicks that you see me using here. Uh, we sell green stuff. We sell Milliput Fine White. We sell all sorts of effects paints. Basically, anything that you see me use here, I try to carry. And some things that I don't use, like masking tape for when you're airbrushing. <laughs> that, that one's funny because on the, on the store page, it actually says, do as Uncle Fuse says, not as Uncle Fuse does. Because, you know, I always say, mask your models, kitties, but I never do it. So, but there's masking tape up there. Uh, there's, you know, all sorts of stuff. If it can help your hobby game files, um, sandpaper for finishing sanding, uh, things like that. If, it, if you can find a product that, you know, helps us in the hobby, whether it's in model building, sculpting, uh, painting, then we are looking at it and trying to find ways to bring more and more of that, you know, onto the store. Um, it doesn't all exist there right now. Some stuff is very hard for us to get because it's really only like some people only distribute, some manufacturers only distribute to places like Hobby Lobby. Obviously we're not big enough to buy product like Hobby Lobby does, but we're trying. I've contacted people like that. We've actually got some of them are like, oh, that's a very unique idea you've got. We'll see if we can find out a way to distribute to you or have you buy from, you know, one of our other suppliers or something like that. So, you know, we're working behind the scenes to make things happen. It's just none of that really happens fast because we're not trying to throw a million bucks at anybody. So. here no idea what's foot and what's not i feel like there's less foot more leather until we get to the toes uh, but yeah just check out slowfusegaming.com the store is right there in your face as you go onto the page 
Um, never be afraid to just go browse around. We add new stuff all the time. Sometimes I'm really horrible about telling you guys that I've added new stuff. I've added probably three or four products this week and I forgot to tell anybody about it. I'm horrible about that. <laughs> like, as much as I, you know, look at Facebook every day, I really am horrible at remembering what I should be putting on Facebook and reminding you people about. I just am horrible at it. Self-promotion, not my best gig. realize his heel was showing. I thought it was covered with leather on this side, but I guess not. I'm guessing no. Come back over here and paint the heel as well and see if it comes to light what the texture is supposed to be. Oh, nope, that's skin, all right. Rip. Guy needs a new stylus, dude. You need coverage on those heels stomping around in spiky sand trying to slaughter your foes feel like you could be doing a better job fashion wise again do not envy these dudes having to fight in the arena in sandals just saying I'm just saying I don't, I'm not making a political conversation here I'm not trying to say that you know their fashion sense is off I'm just saying like maybe just maybe some steel toed shoes would come in handy every now and then. I feel like that's a thing. Okay, bronze toed shoes. Sorry, it's not the steel age yet. I get it. Get it. Know your history. Why did they have shitty swords back then? Can you imagine being stabbed with like tarnished bronze? Can you, can you imagine being stabbed? <laughs> We also officiate, officiate weddings for the right price, says Uncle Touchy. We do. Uncle Touchy became a reverend this week. So now, Slow Fuse Gaming. For all your hobby needs. And... Matrimony ceremonies. Awesome. Jen could even take the photos. That could be a thing. Can you imagine if we were like your wedding planners? How horrible that would be for you? Agent Arrow, you haven't had a chance to try your bomb wicks, but they're looking at you seductively. That's why we made them. They just stare at you from the corner, make you feel uncomfortable. Thank you, Sir Lathan. Thank you for hanging out, man. The community is better for all of you guys. You make it what it is. We just sit up here and we're just talking heads. You guys push us to do better things every day. I love it. Grins, uh, you took those texture stamps to the LGS and the guy loved them. He's going to try to carry them in stock now. Thanks, dude. Oh, great. Just robbed me of sales. Awesome. <laughs> Grins. That's awesome, man. Sidon, you're watching me on a virtual screen in VR? Say what? You're in VR? Can we reach out and high five? Are you in VR? Can we VR high five? Come on, side. Give me a... Can we high five? Tell me you just did that in VR. That would be the best thing ever. Here, I'll do it again. VR paint-alongs. How great would that be? Sandals by Achilles. <laughs> oh, but don't bump. Official Ray Long, do you ever load your brush with multiple colors, aka loaded brush technique? If so, any tutorials? I hate that term, loaded brush technique. It's such a horrible term. Um, it's called tip loading. And the, because loaded brush, could be anything right it's like saying food what did you eat for dinner tonight food how did you paint your model with a loaded brush i don't understand what that means so and i'm not i'm not saying that to you i just hate that term tip loading is something where you you load the brush with one color say flesh tone and then you go with a very very light tone of paint on the tip only and then as you paint right you can use the brush to kind of bring the body of the brush with the dark tone and then right as the tip hits bring just a little pin spot of brightness in that blends with it easily uh, it's a neat technique for doing like light um, light to dark transitions on non-metallic metals sometimes um, i think that it is something that is what's the best way for me to say this i'll probably offend some people it's a technique that was created so that somebody could say they created a technique because it's useless in the in the grand scheme of thing. It's very, very situational. You're not going to be able to use it on very large surfaces very well. So if you learn it on small surfaces as a way to do kind of your highlight and your pinpoint stuff, 
and you don't learn an, another technique to do the same, then when you get to surfaces where that doesn't work, because if you're doing anything bigger than pretty much the, you know, the width of your brush, it becomes very difficult to use because as you start moving side to side, you lose the, the ability to control that tip load. So you really wanna be able to draw linear strokes with it, which is great for like edging. If you wanna edge some non-metallic metal, you can pull a nice kind of mid-tone highlight and then just spot it with that bright highlight that blends at the end, it's great. But then when you go to a bigger surface, it doesn't work at all. So, sorry, my two cents, it was created by somebody that needed to feel like they created something. I feel like it's not really, I, I, don't, I don't like it. So. <laughs> Assassin Red, is my eyesight going? No, well, yeah, yeah, let's be honest. I'm 47 years old and I didn't know it was until Jen got me these glasses. Well, she got the glasses for her, right? She got the glasses for her because she needs reading glasses. I never used them. And then she got it for me and I'm like, oh, wow, that changes everything at about four inches away from my eyes, but I can't see with them for other than that. I ain't ashamed to say I'm getting old. If I can use anything, that'll be great. You just finished a commission of 100 Romans and four full chariots with horses, Sir Lathan? Holy hell. <laughs> Ray Silver, you bastard. Mahogany colored wedding dresses are a thing. Yes. Slade, what's going on? Welcome back. I am doing fine. Hope you are as well. Sidering, of course you high five me virtually. That's so awesome. Yeah, official Ray Long. No, that's no problem. I, like I said, I was just I was just saying it's one of those that gets me a little bit. It gets a, a little bit of, of a dander up with me because I just don't... There's so many techniques that you can learn that you can paint well with. And when there's one that comes out that's like that, that I when I looked at it first, I was like, I don't even know why that exists. You can create that exact same effect with just multiple process. So I guess it's something that if you wanted to do it really quick, you know, it helps. But learning it is not quick. And at the end of the day, it's very specific how you use it, so... But like I said, there's there's as, as many ways to paint as there are painters. And none of them are wrong, and none of them are wholly right. So, you know, just take it as you will. My goal is to show you guys enough variety in how to put paint on a model that you can find something that really sticks for you, right, that feels comfortable. I don't know what that'll be. For everybody, it's a little bit different. You know, I've got people that as soon as they learn how to get the right thinness of paint and see the layering that I do start to work for them, that they're just like off and running and now their models take on a whole new life. That's great. For some people, it's teaching them a weathering technique that they didn't know about before and it gives them new birth to get out and start trying some new things on model. It doesn't matter what it is. Find a technique that you think is really cool that you want to try and try it. And if it sticks with you, use it. Guaranteed. Don't listen to me say that I don't understand why they made that technique. Don't listen to somebody else say that's stupid. You know, just also don't listen to people say it's the best thing since sliced bread, right? Because it doesn't work for everybody. And so try it. You see something, you see the effect you like, like, holy hell, that guy got that amazing highlight off of using this technique I saw. Try it. See if you can make it, you know, recreate the same thing. See if they can teach it to you in a manner that makes sense and then go. Run the race, man. Whatever it takes you to get to the point where you can finish consistently, get paint on models, and at the end of the day, enjoy what you've created, that's what we're here for, right? As artists, that's what we should be here for if we choose to support one another, you know, and, and be able to say, you know, hey, you know, what are you trying? You know, if I can give you any help at all, that's what I want it to be. It's guaranteed, I learn something new every time I put paint on a model, it seems. even when you're self-taught, right? I make silly mistakes and sometimes they work to your advantage and you're like, oh, holy hell, that made a really, really cool color I didn't know existed. We did that not too long ago, right? I think we were working with mahogany and the jade on the bear, the angry Kung Fu Panda bear. And I got some jade on something that should have been non-metallic gold. And so when I went back over it with the base of mahogany, or not mahogany, burnt umber, Right? I went over the jade with the burnt umber to do my base coating for the non-metallic gold and was blown away at how good the burnt umber looked over the jade. 
right? And so I have now started painting an entire army with that as its base coloring. That jade as a base coat, which is not something I would normally do, and then I go over it with the burnt umber. And it gives me a really cool, kind of weird, otherworldly, rusty color that I couldn't get anywhere else very quick. So never be afraid to try new stuff, man. Just do it. As Shia LaBeouf would say, do it. Don't let your dreams be dreams. <laughs> Don't let your dreams be dreams. Let them be reality, I guess is the point there, right? Right. Good about this. These damn sandals. They're leather strappy straps. All right, so I think after tons and tons of talking, I think we're pretty good with skin tone now. I'm happy where we're at. He does have hair poking out underneath there too that I didn't realize. Go back and make sure that from all of my angles, I've at least got you know hey, somebody likes us. good coverage of this base coat of flesh tone with the tan flesh over everything in between fingers. Thank you for that follow, Steck. Welcome, my friend. Still got a little bit of black primer showing between the fingers on this upper hand. I'm gonna go back and do that. Lighten up these knuckles a little bit. Bring a little bit more light paint on the shoulders. Not too much. I feel like that's pretty good. All right. Now, after all of that, what are we gonna do with this for? Two and a half hours, it seems like. Holy hell. Now we gotta go to color number two. I'm making you want to rewrite the song Many Shades of Black to Many Ways to Shade Black. <laughs> hey, Mavis, what's happening, man? There's never a good instructional vid in front of Paywall about how to do loaded brush. You thought the trick was more double paint load on brush from Toll Painting and hey, Craft somebody Max. likes us. I don't know what that means. Buildable data. What's going on? Thank you. Welcome for the... Thank you. Welcome for the follow. Man, English is hard. Welcome. Thank you for the follow. <laughs> And Ascendi, thank you too. Thank you for all the new follows we're getting today. Loaded brush versus loaded artist. That could be a thing too. That could be a thing too. Jen Praxis, uh, this is the Tribune from Arena Rex. Um, Arena Rex is a great new game. Well, it's not new. It's been around for a while, but it's new to us. Uh, from Red Republic Studios in Austin, Texas. Uh, it's an amazing fighting game. I mean, it's literally, you know, the Roman Colosseum and gladiator battles, and it is done so well. We haven't even talked about rules. We've just been talking about painting. We're currently doing the paint along. Um, the Uglove here in chat, uh, Nick, uh, was kind enough from Red Republic to get us some of the Tribune model. It is the first, I think, the first of the Ludus Magnus models to be released since their original Kickstarter. Um, and it was given to us pre-release style so that people in the store could buy it and paint along with us on stream. So we are going to, at the end of the stream, take a look at what everybody else has been doing with their model so we can see where they're at uh, in the process. Today, obviously, we're working on skin, but this is just a Roman gladiator, and this is the Tribune. And uh, right now, we're going to start working in next on Barbarian Flesh, which is our first highlight tone. So for those of you following along at home, break out your Barbarian Flesh. And just like we've been doing, we're going to create very, very thin glazes of Barbarian Flesh. It's a really, really good jump up from Tanned. Uh, Army Painter nailed it, hit it out of the park with this, as far as their color content. Both hue and shade on this triad going from um, tan Flesh up to, well, in their case, I think Elven Flesh is their brightest skin tone. Uh, but we're gonna use this Barbarian Flesh next. And you'll see as I put it on my thumb, still ultra, ultra wet. And now what we wanna do is we wanna start being very specific with our placement. We wanna start grabbing the top of muscle groups, right? All of these highlight spots that we started with. Right, where we started layering up a little bit more of our tan flesh. Now we're going to start focusing in with this next color. Right. 
Again, we're going to have to build it up, but like right here on the top of the forearm on the inside, top of this bicep. Right, and just make sure you're not too opaque with your paint. Notice how as I'm painting that on there, let's zoom in. Right, I've hit that top of that, that bicep there four or five times already, and I still don't have a whole lot of paint built up. Right, as opposed to taking it you know, square off the brush with the paint out of the bottle and getting, you know, super, super bright. That's not what we're going for. We just want to barely brighten it up at all and then be able to pick and choose how bright and where by layering up slowly like we were before. So here I'm going to focus on this part of the arm. Of course, using my arms never works because I have tattoos all over them, but this section of the arm, right? We just want to brighten up that muscle and then work thinner as we get towards the wrist. So the high, the bulk of our highlight is right down here. Right? And then we'll just kind of thin it out as we go up towards the wrist. We also want to kind of come down here on this section underneath. So, out a little bit so I'm not completely out of focus all the time. Again, making sure that because I'm painting so wet, I get most of that paint off of the brush before going onto the model. Top of the shoulder, right through here. Also want to get these area on the palm, like the thumb that's sticking out towards the sun here, tops of these fingers. Now it's not our final highlight, we will be working more, so you don't have to treat it like, you know, a definitive last color, right? But we want to just be specific on where it goes, leaving enough of that darker flesh tone underneath it that we get those transitions. Notice how I'm, as I'm painting the fingers, I'm actually going through and I'm painting each part bend of the digit with a sideways brush stroke. I can zoom in on this, you'll see, right? Notice how I'm going through and I'll paint the tip sideways. Then I'll do a little bit more on this pad of the finger and then a little bit more right down here at the palm. Like so leaving those darker areas in between. All right, again, across the top pad of the finger, on the middle finger, grab that kind of middle pad. Outside of the pinky, but leave that bend, that crease right there at the palm, leave that dark. Come around a little bit on the side of the hand, but not too much. Outside of the forefinger, webbing in between the thumb. Again, top pad of the thumb. A little bit on the outside. Hey, somebody likes us. Americium. What's going on? I hope I didn't butcher your name. I'm like, uh, that's not a word I use every day. <laughs> Thank you for the follow. All right, so we'll go a little bit. More on the thumb, right here at the base. Just want to be thinking, how is light going to hit this model, right? And start really separating out those values now. I've got the tendon on the back of the hand that runs up towards the knuckle line. Right? I want to accentuate that a little bit. Right? But leaving enough darkness on the hand that you can see how now the back of the hand starts falling into shadow more, right? Notice how now as the fingers start to brighten, now all of this becomes darker. Again, I'll just kind of take lightly the edge of the finger where it would glow. It faces the highlight area. A little bit on this middle finger knuckle. A little bit more on the back of the hand for that tendon. Add a little bit of brightness down the knuckles. Right. 
leaving the darkness down here at the wrist. And a little bit of highlight on the outside pad of this part of the palm coming down out of the pinky. A little bit of highlight there. Okay. Just play around with it, right? Because we're painting thin, we can afford to take risks. None of the paint that we put on here is going to be game-changing. If you don't like it, you can go back over it with a darker color. We talk about it all the time. It's that seesaw or that push-pull that we do as we're doing flesh. You work shadows on one direction, you pull it back, highlights in another direction. If the highlights get a little bit too big, you push a little bit more shadow into it. Pull a little bit more highlight out of that. Work on all the different parts of the model as you need to in order to get the balance done. Right. The big key here is maintaining a, a consistent view of the model from where light is hitting it and where the shadow should fall. Right, So top of this arm as we come through here, it's got this dish shape. We just want to make sure that we keep highlighting towards the top and leave the bottom a little bit dimmer. Right? If we bring this same color down through the bottom of the arm, that's when we risk busting up our value. So if I start coming down here, and let's say I want you know, a little bit more brightness on the side of the arm here, and I take this around too far, right? let's just do it for emphasis sake. If I take it around and I start highlighting down here on the underside of the arm, then I'm going to say, oh, well, that was really supposed to be shade, and now it's going to throw everything off. Now up here, I see that highlight come around to underneath, but there's no highlight underneath here on this part of the arm. So why would that exist that way, All right? So in that case, we can come back and take a little bit of our darker color that we were using. If you happen to do this, don't like your highlight after looking at it, just take a little bit of your darker paint that you just used before and slap it back on that area. Like I said, Push shadow on, pull highlight out of shadow. Keep plussing it back and forth until you balance it out the way you need to. Don't be afraid to go back to the model with a previous color if you happen to put a little bit too much on in a place. So I'll just put a little bit more of this underneath. Hang up here on the hand. Balance it out. I might even want to. Doesn't like it the way that's looking. I might want to come back in here and kind of darken in on the bicep as well. Right and now, you've got that brightness and darkness back the way you wanted it. Right. So never be worried about it because we're painting thin. You're not ever putting so much material on that it's going to mess the model up if you get a little bit someplace that you don't intend for it. As you're learning, as you're getting better with you know associating value on the model, where your bright spots are, where you want your shadows. Right? It's better to be able to kind of have that fearless approach than to sit back and be afraid to put paint on the model. So if there's one thing I teach more over than not, it's that painting thin like this should help you get to that point where you're never really afraid. You're not just going to go gangbusters in and start throwing paint at a model. That's not what I'm saying. Right? What I'm saying is that with you know, the proper technique, just don't be afraid to go in and try a color. You know, try pushing some highlight into an area, see how it works. And, and you can do it a little bit more kind of free-spirited if you know that you can just drop the previous dark color back over it or the previous bright color back over it to get back to where you were. Right. So again, just working the tops of the muscles on this side. Notice how all of a sudden our shadow on the bottom of the arm gets even darker as we brighten up the tops. Make sure that as I'm, because I'm highlighting from one side and the other around a cylinder, I want to make sure they meet in the middle and are bright, you know, on the top of these muscles. That makes sense. We highlighted from over here, right? Getting the shoulder and the bicep like this. And that looked good. Then we highlight from over here and that looks good. And sometimes you'll find that, oh, but right in the middle, we didn't get a highlight. So just make sure that you drag those two highlights together so it doesn't look like he's got racing stripes. Also get the middle of this section of the arm, this tendon that runs right through here. Top of this muscle group over here on the forearm as well. Right, a 
a little bit down from the wrist, not too much. Starting to really like the way that's looking. Brighten up a little bit of this muscle down here on the underneath, not too bright. I don't want to put like a bunch of layers and make it match the top, but I can come just with a little bit of brightness on the underside, kind of a reverse glow, if you will. Down low, same thing here on this little part of the back coming out of the armor here, just a little. So, Bingo. Starting to look good. And again, we're just building color up as we go. If you find that when you're done, you're like, well, this maybe this looks a little too dark for me. I want to brighten up that little spot going into the muscles into the elbow there. Feel free. Try it. The goal is just not to highlight. You don't want to go and say, oh, this muscle needs some highlight. And this muscle needs some highlight. And this guy over here needs some. No, the top of the arm does. The bottom of the arm necessarily doesn't. Well, you know, you, you might find that like you've got this tendon on the bottom of the arm. Maybe you want to give it just a little bit of pull out like that, right? So that you get that detail there. This sculpt has a really nice spot in it so that if you just do a little bit of highlight, you might find that darkness that it creates in between that one and this one coming out of that wrist makes sense, right? Gives you something that you want to see on the model. Fine, do it, Like right? Artistic license. Just don't brighten up the bottom of the arm so much that it starts looking like it's not in shadow and looks like the top of the arm. Then you lose the whole composition, right? The goal is to make sure that from certain angles, we still have darker flesh down here than we do up here. <laughs> Richard, cool story, Bob. Sir Lathan, I use a uh, Canon video camera. It's an HD Canon video camera with a manual zoom right on the camera body. So I don't have to do the digital zoom thing. I just reach up and press the button. They make one that's remote. If I ever have to change the camera, which Knockwood camera, I love you. Don't go breaking. I don't want to have to replace you. But they make one with a remote with it would be cool. I could just sit here and kind of press a button. Then it wouldn't matter if the camera was up high. Sometimes we have to mount the camera up high just so we can do larger models and stuff. Burning Beard, what's going on, man? Welcome back, man. It has been a long time. Richard, you got to go. Your back is killing you. Sorry to hear it, man. Take care. Good to have you. Hey, Flyrant, what's going on? All right. So now let's move over to... It's 4.30. We still got some time before we got to pass it on to Kenny. It is the Tuesday bromance. Kenny should have if he's done his job right. He hadn't, he hadn't said so in chat today, I don't think. But if he did his job right, he should have some bomb wicks. I'm hoping he uses them today. Hashtag don't hold your breath, but maybe. All right, so now on the back of his left arm, same thing. We want to highlight these muscle groups coming out from underneath the uh, the shoulder guard, right? We want to split them as they come out, follow that natural musculature. But here, we're going to have a little bit of a different shape because the arm is not horizontal, right? It's up and down, so we want to pull that highlight Along the back, a little bit here as it comes into the elbow. Forearm as it goes into the arm guard there, right? Notice how we're maintaining a little bit of shadow. Now we have this arm guard or this shoulder pad here that's gonna put shadow on the arm as well. So when we go to highlight like this muscle group here, we don't wanna push it all the way up to the top. We wanna leave it a little bit dark as it goes up towards that shoulder pad. Same thing with the bicep. In front of the bicep, we'll put a little bit of brightness. Just on the top of the muscle there. But you want to leave it a little darker as it goes around the circumference of the shoulder guard. And you also want it to be a little dark at the bottom as it starts dropping into shadow at the inside of the elbow. Right? So you're just narrowing your band of highlight as you go of this forearm muscle across there and there we go 
So you can see how the area where our first coat of uh, tanned flesh interacted with the black undercoat and gave us that really dark shadow between the bicep and the tricep. And then as we layered it up around that, it became brighter towards the tan flesh. Now we brighten it up a little bit more and it looks like we get three or four colors of flesh in there, when in reality, we've only got the two. Really, really liking this model. Uh, we'll drop down onto the hand. Here we just want to get the top of the hand and across those top knuckles. Starting with the forefinger and the middle finger. And across the knuckle of the little finger and the ring finger over here and the tops of those. Leaving a little bit of darkness again around the wrist guard. See how I'm doing that? I'm not painting bright color all the way up into the wrist guard because I'll lose that line. Right? The goal with the way that I paint, remember, is to not ever have to use wash. You know, uh, oh, if, and if I do, it's only in very specific situations. I don't want to have to rely on wash to bring all my shadows back. So for me, it's just take this extra time here to not put paint there, and I maintain that shadow between the hand and the wrist guard that gives me what a wash would create later on without the impact of discoloring the flesh on the hand. Right. And again, just kind of pick how much you want the finger to get brighter as it goes down. Probably want to leave the bottom sides of the fingers here a little bit darker because they wrap around underneath the weapon. And just kind of bring my highlight using the side of the brush to pick up that sculpt just down to these knuckles. Okay. And then maybe a little bit here like that. There you go. A little bit of highlight on this thumb over here. Side of the hand, top of the thumb. Not too bright back there because it gets closer to the body so it wouldn't be quite as bright. Now notice, looks like my hand got a little bit bright. Thanks for the bits, by the way. Sir Lathan, dropping dimes. Thank you, sir. Um, notice how the hand now has brightened up beyond the musculature on the upper arm. So we want to balance that out. There's not a real reason why the hand would be brighter. So I like the brightness of the hand, not mad at that. So rather than cover that up, what I'll do is I'll just bring some more brightness onto these muscle groups up here. Playing by the same rules I did before, leaving a little bit of highlight in the middle and letting it go into shadow as it gets closer up towards the arm guard or the shoulder guard, I keep calling it arm guard, right? and just kind of working this highlight towards the middle. Elbow. Like so. Now it's much more in line with the hand. This muscle's starting to pop a little bit more right here. Same with the middle of this muscle group, but it's all blended nice, so it doesn't look like there's just a spot of color hanging out in the middle of that anywhere. You don't want to just paint a spot, again, why we're working so thin, so that you can't really tell, you know, where one color stops and another one starts. Right. Again, it falls into shadow as it goes across the back of the arm here. We can take a little bit of this now that we don't have much paint left on the brush and just kind of work it into the shadow slightly to continue that fade that we got from our tanned flesh. There you go. Nice blend. It goes into almost pure darkness as it goes in towards the inside of the body there, but there's still a flesh tone up inside that arm. Same way as we fall off down here into the underarm, there's still a flesh tone there, but the brightness sits on top. Really, really easy when you get the feel of working thin. Do a little bit on the throat. Agent Era, if the camera is anything like yours, there's a mini USB port on the side and you can attach it to a computer, it is not like yours. I don't have a mini USB port. It's only for charging. It doesn't have like any camera controls on it that I know of. If it did, I wouldn't want to use a piece of software. That's the whole problem. I don't want to have to look at the computer, move a mouse and do that. The manual part is what makes it for me. Selling weasel butt hair brushes. <laughs> 
<laughs> we're afraid people would be confused about whether they were made with weasel butt hair or they were supposed to be used on weasel butts. <laughs> these are these brushes are only for painting weasel butts. That would be a very specific product, LT. Armin's Wrath, you just used up all your store credit at the local game store buying my brushes. You hope they're worth it? Holy hell, Armin. Yeah, they are. And thank you. Hey, Viking, what's going on? All right, again, I'm liking what we got. Let's work a little bit on the throat. I'm hoping we can push through here. We got about 15 minutes. I'm hoping we can push a little bit further. But we got Kenny following us today, so I can't run late. Tomorrow we'll pick up right where we left off and move on with finishing up the skin. And hopefully tomorrow moving into some of the armor. And then on Friday, continuing with armor and then into things like the cloak and details. We get just a little bit of highlight on the Adam's apple here. Not too much. All right, just brighten it up enough to where it shoves that other color down a little bit. We get that nice transition. Compare it to the arm, which is the closest flesh to it. Make sure you don't over highlight the, the throat, you know, and don't, you know, take up too much of your shadow. You want to keep it to where it looks fairly similar to the flesh that's close to it. This is going to wind up being more in shadow because it's underneath his head. So we'll come back when we do some of our later glazing and, uh, and darken that back down. But right now, setting values for how those muscles protrude. It's fine to go in and just brighten them up and comparatively speaking, keep it like the arm next to it. All right, so that's looking good. Let's do these knees. Again, making sure I don't take too much paint over to the model. Start with the top of the knee over here on his right leg. Staying away from the spot where the skin goes in to the skirt or the robe. I keep calling it a skirt. He'd probably be mad at me. It's not a skirt. All right, whatever, man. Your toga. Again, being very particular, not painting, not just shoving paint on the entire knee. I'm getting the kneecap right here, leaving a little space around the kneecap to make it maintain that darkness. Right. Then going up on the top, small strokes, just blending in a little bit of brightness, leaving that darkness in and along the toga line. Toga line. Now it sounds silly when I say toga. Damn it. Just don't put light paint right up next to the clothes. <laughs> All right. The brightest spot here will be that thigh muscle and put a little bit of highlight. So it goes there, a little bit of highlight down low here, not too much. Smudge that with my finger just to make sure we don't get it too overdone. And that's pretty much all we need right there. Not a whole lot to say about that. Not a whole lot of skin showing. You just want to make sure you maintain this detail. The sculpt isn't super strong right here, but it's nice and has the detail in it, right? It's just not like a like an orc or a space marine where these muscles have huge cliffs that fall back in that heroic scaling it's more realistic so in order to get it to where visually you can see those muscles you can't paint them the same way we would do other models you've got to take the time to just make sure you don't put paint in certain places so that you get that contrast right i get this line formed here right this little carrot of shadow where the thigh muscles are right over the kneecap there, right? And again, working thin like we are keeps it from, you know, being overly abusive. It all blends in rather nicely. Keep it going down onto the feet. Much less highlight on the feet. We probably just want to grab the tops of the toes here. Maybe a little bit. On the top of the foot there not too much because that foot if you look at the model the way he's stepping this foot the knee protrudes and then the shin goes back for balance and the foot is actually always up underneath the body except on this side i guess on this instep it'll have a little bit brighter contrast maybe even a little bit of brightness on the heel we can play with 
right? Because light would be able to come through here and there's nothing really blocking it. So you can put a little bit of lighting, light color on the inside there, but not too much. Right? I'm gonna wipe off most of my paint before I go up here and get this top of this calf muscle. I don't want much pigment here at all. A little bit of glow on the calf. And then I can pretty much leave the rest of the leg alone, right? I, if I go in and I start highlighting all of these little bitty sections, I'm gonna lose any of the dark flesh that was there because these little slices in between the leather on uh, the sandal lacing are so small, right? I might be able to get a little bit down here by the ankle because that's a little bit of a broader spot, right? But other than that spot where the calf muscle is and right here on the heel, each of those little spots inside the laces is so small that if you put any brightness in there, when we go back and paint the, the straps, you'll find that the dark flesh goes away entirely and you wind up with these little slivers of bright flesh that don't make sense. So rather than paint them bright now, just leave them alone. Leave them with the dark flesh in there. Then when we paint the leather straps, if they are too dark, then we can go back and highlight them just a little bit, but it'll guide us a little better. Don't try to make that, uh, that step now because what you will hate is if you brighten it too much, paint the leather straps, and then you have to find a way to fill in that little triangle of flesh specifically with dark color, because then you'll have to get it on the straps, you'll have to paint the straps again, so on and so forth. Better to not put anything there right now, paint the straps. If the flesh is too dark, that's good, because you want it dark around the straps, so then you can just put a small dot of highlight in there, and a lot easier to do than trying to paint that entire little panel again. Make sense? All right, let's keep motivating. Kenny, are you in here? Kenny's probably not in here. He's probably getting ready for his stream. I was gonna tell him I might be running a little bit over. Get the top of the knee very lightly over on this leg. This leg, again, always take a step back and look at how the model stands, right? This leg goes back in underneath the, uh, the model entirely, right? So from this angle, there's only gonna be a little bit of highlight and it's all gonna be catching the top areas of these muscles. So things like this on the knee, a little bit where that wrinkle of the knee is formed. It has like a dimple that forms on the top of the knee there. Well, huzzah, we get a little huzzah. bit of this we'll thigh muscle, but I don't want to grab too much of that. With delight. Thank you for the sub, who that? Bad paints, what's going on? Thank you so much. Welcome back. All right, again, toes down here are fine. Not going to do anything else between the the straps of the of the uh, sandal in there until we get to this side because again just like the other foot this one there's sunlight that comes down this side and there's nothing really to block it except for the weapon here so we can start highlighting a little bit down low and all we do is just not push it up too far up into our already kind of dark flesh that we got working here right just a little bit up on the spots of the muscle that stand proud Side of the knee here, a little bit like that. And notice how we get that really nice fade up into dark flesh by where the weapon is, right? But we just brighten it up a little bit at the knee there. And then again, this spot here, as it goes into the top of the calf is okay. The top of the calf itself is probably okay. And then just kind of this outside of the muscle as it goes down the leg, you can brighten up that a little bit like so. Then as we come down to the ankle, just the side of the ankle and a little bit of the back of the heel. Ankle itself looks like it's covered with a strap. We're just gonna get a little bit there. Top of the toes. Bingo. That's probably all we need to do on him on this leg. Not too much. Remember, one of the things, we haven't said it yet today, but one of the things I'm always talking about, don't ever take one part of the model so far that you extend beyond where the rest of the model is ready to be, right? So you're not gonna finish the flesh 100%. Um, and before, you know, moving on to something else. That's kind of not going to do you a lot of good because if you oversaturate it value-wise, uh, overextend one of your hues before you've moved into what the rest of the model wants to look like, then you might be making some bad decisions and you might have to come back and alter, 
you know, things that you've spent a lot of time working on already, right? So here I'm really happy with this. We've got good darkness on there. Might be able to brighten up the side of this knee just a little bit more. Into the inner thigh there. So, right, but we leave this inside of the calf that's back there. Notice how we keep that dark. We haven't really highlighted that at all. We can throw a little bit in there just to make it interesting. Like so, but not too much. All right. We've got the weapon casting this natural shadow on it, and we're highlighting that by just not bringing a lot of bright color up underneath the thigh spot here. That works rather well. Arm is looking good. Throat is looking good. Flesh tones are really starting to come to life here. Spartan painting, what's going on? Doomski, you got your order today. Holy hell, that was quick. <laughs> you uploaded a butt shot twice when you get to whip, whip later? Hell yeah. Absorbing the secret technique. Nothing secret around here, Viking. You know better than that. Maui Blood, you'll be less neurotic about that one rando strand on your bomb wicks after seeing me use it without any difficulties? <laughs> Um, you know, with any sables, with any natural hair brushes, even the Winsor Newtons that I get, I usually have to clip one or two strands off of. So if you've ever had or used a, a natural brush, uh, sometimes because of the way they process it in the factory, um, they put, you know, like a finishing gel on them, you know, and after it dries out, you get it wet, it dries out. There might be a stray hair. This one's been really good. You know, this one's got so much because I work so thin. That's really abusive to sables. Um, it pushes so much paint into the ferrule. If you look, you can see. See how the brush goes from this nice natural sable color to where it's the same color we're painting right now? It's that flesh, barbarian flesh, all down here at the ferrule. That's the paint that's causing the problem with your brush, right? Because as paint gets in there and dries, I show this on stream all the time. Notice how if I pinch the brush down low, that's, the, that's what paint does as it dries, is it constricts the brush and starts pinching it down here. And you'll notice that it causes the brush to split. That pinching motion there splits the hairs. I'm not touching the tip of the brush, but the tip is screwing up completely. Because that's as paint constricts it at the ferrule, that's what causes it to, to do that crazy stuff. So if you see your brush doing that too much, just clean it. Get some brush soap. Push brush soap up in the, in the ferrule. If after a while you wind up with one or two hairs that wind up always kind of kinking off to the side, uh, you can always just clip them. Just make sure that you clip them at the base. Right? So if you've got it, just run your clippers down until it's all like at a 45 or 90 degree angle at the base and then clip it down here at the base of the ferrule. If you don't and it's like half of a hair up here, it will still gather paint and it will push paint into the ferrule quicker because you're never unloading it. So I see a lot of people that clip the tip of their brushes. Don't ever do that. Um, you know, just take whatever stray hair is there, run it down to the side and then clip it off right at the base so that it's not helping to draw paint anymore. All natural hair brushes will do that to some extent. Luckily, we haven't had to, I haven't had to clip a single hair. Well, maybe I did. I think I clipped one hair off of our number three out of the new set. But on the initial set, I had to clip like two off of the number one and things like that before they finally settled down. So never feel bad about it. All right. It's 4.59. We're going to stop here for today. I think we've got a good workup so that you guys can, you know, play around. Those of you that are following along and doing the paint along, um, let's get some pictures up on the website right now. We'll go take a look at them. Uh, I'm excited to see what you guys have got. I know that uh, Ray posted his, so hopefully we'll see some from other you other guys. There's like a dozen of these out there, so I know we got people painting along, and uh, so hopefully get some good pictures in there. Tomorrow, what we'll do when we start out is uh, we're going to start in with initially going in with some color. Um, so we'll be pushing the cam dark green and the wasteland soil into our flesh. I don't want to get into doing that tonight. Uh, first of all, I don't want to run long and keep Kenny held up. But second of all, uh, I don't want to do that because we kind of need to work both of this process in with the next highlight together. It makes more sense to not just tell you, now just shade green in the shadows. Because if I tell you that, you can get carried away. 
you need to see how it progresses in order to really make it work. So tomorrow what we'll do is we'll start with adding in our greens um, and our wasteland soils to get those kind of uh, subdermal hey, capillary and vein us. action going on the skin to really kind of bring it to life and pull all this together. All right, but right now I'm really happy with how we've got it here. This is just two colors of skin over our black primer. You know, as hard as it is to work thin over black primer, it turns out looking really, really good. All you got to do is be patient work the uh you know work your layers up one after another and there's no pre-highlight on this but we're already getting some good value uh the muscle groups are starting to pop you got brightness on them shadow where we need shadow no matter what the room light is doing see i'm still getting good shadow there good shadow there right good shadow on the outside of the hand just take a look at your model and see if there's any areas that are deficit i'm really digging the way we've got the thigh blend going on here in the shadow up top yep i'm happy with it so tomorrow we'll just start accentuating this. We'll show how as we put the greens and the reds on it, it will actually shade the whole skin tone down and then we'll bring more highlight out of it. And that'll be where we work our final value into the skin. And shouldn't take us, but maybe, I don't know, maybe an hour, maybe an hour and a half of tomorrow's stream. We should be able to finish up the skin and then move on towards armor. Armor is the next thing. So awesome. Let's jump over to whip and see what you guys got cooking. How about it? How about it? exclamation point whip i am only going to have a chance to look at the stuff that's going on i think depending now if not a lot of people posted pictures of what they've been doing with the tribune we might take a look at some other stuff but i'm gonna i'm gonna go through and look at everybody's tribune picks first so let's see what we got do we have any really there's only these all right we got a couple all right let's take a look here first up i think this is ray ray silver Ray Silver doing the paint along. Holy hell, Ray, this is looking really good. Ray was complaining early on saying that he felt like his heavy handedness was causing some problems with regard to working so thin, but you've pulled out of that, man. This is looking really good. Right here on the knee, I'm seeing it really come to life. My scroll wheel hates me. Let's see if we can get it on here centered. Yeah, this is looking really good, Ray. Your skin tones are really starting to come out. You've done a really good job of keeping the brights away from the clothing line here, which is what you gotta do so that you get the knee to pop really drives on this shadow. So again, we're not trying to have to add a lot of washes in here. Uh, same thing, I can see the brightness coming out of the throat. You left good darkness going up into the helm. Uh, same thing on the top of the hand. I'm seeing good shadows working into the weapon. Uh, maybe put a little bit more brightness here on the, on the bicep. Not too much because again, it's up underneath the shoulder guard, but maybe just a little bit to cradle it right down at the bottom. But I'm really liking what I'm seeing. This is great work, man. Great work. I know you got some more on here, so let's see what some of the other angles are. Yeah. Again, great stuff here. Good highlight coming across the top of the arm. Good highlight on the back of the arm. I'm digging it. I'm digging it. You did find a way to sneak some skin tone in there. I'll look at my model and see if I want to do that. I didn't notice. It looks like on yours there is kind of a hole there where you might be able to see flesh through the helmet. I like it. Highlight on the outside of the ankle back here. Let me get that down to where everybody can see it. You've got a good highlight coming down the outside around the Achilles and then right on the outside of the heel, but good shadow on the inside. Same on the outstep on this foot over here. Dude, you've, you've nailed it. You've nailed it. Ray carrying it home. I like to see it. I think you said you had double butt shot. Yep. Double butt shot from Ray. Let's close that one out. Let's take a look at who else we got here. Houdini 7, you know he's not fully assembled. Hey, there's nothing wrong with that. Painting and assemblies is great. We didn't talk about it on the stream today, but there's not ever a problem with keeping that arm with the weapon off so that you can get better, um, you know, view and uh, accessibility to the rest of the model. Uh, you know me, I'm just stupid and I paint all my models already glued together. Again, I'm really digging it. You've really nailed it. Uh, uh, you know, the things I'm going to look at on this model first off are this knee because that gives you your, your best spot, I think, down low on the body to see how your brightness and darkness are contrasting. You got a really good, uh, nice, natural brightness going on in the knee, just like Ray. Uh, but I still see that nice dark shadow as it tailors off into the inside of the thigh. The muscle groups up here on the arm look fantastic right good subtle blending here but good peak highlight on the shoulder and the bicep the outside of the arm little bit of peeking in underneath on the tricep here really good thumb outside of the hand good stuff man good stuff Teranamoki, welcome thank you for that follow i really really dig this great work houdini let's see more i know there's more of you out there painting it although there might be some people that have to watch the vod I do recognize that there are some who are watching the VOD later, so we'll probably get more tomorrow. This was Houdini as he was prepped and ready to go. Look at this setup, man. 
Hashtag jealous. Are you kidding me? He's got like, what is all this? He got like audio gear and, or is that a ham radio? You listen to the police scanner while you're watching painting? <laughs> Some douchebag over here on a, on a computer screen with a lot of paint. I like it, man. That's a good setup. I'm jealous. Houdini with the good setup going on. Let's do a refresh real quick, see if anybody else has posted up any of their paint along stuff. I'm assuming we'll get more tomorrow after the VOD. It is Whip Wednesday anyway. Yep, here we go. Bingo. Uglove, the man Nick himself. Nick, Uglove in chat, is the Arena Rex guy. So he works with Red Republic Studios and uh, is the whole reason we're able to do this. And this is, man, this is looking really good. I am going to zoom in a little bit on Nick's here because it's got more other stuff in the picture. Let's get in close. Yep, same thing, Nick. I'm seeing it. This is really coming to life really well right here. Blends are looking really good. Fantastic work. Same thing. On this, so far, what we've done, because of the the kind of sloppiness on the leg until we get the straps done, we'll, we'll be working that later. But this knee and this arm really tell the story. Again, great highlights on the hand. Keeping the highlight paint, you know, as we go brighter and brighter, keep it away from dark areas. You know, just steady that hand and do it. And you guys, all three of these have just nailed it, right? Nice, crisp, bright highlights on the arm. Good shadow looks like. Good coverage is the big key on all of that. This knee is looking really natural. As the colors poke out from underneath the clothing, good muscle tone. Fantastic stuff, man. You become too reliant on washes? I don't use washes at all. Um, like, the only time I use washes, and it, there's nothing wrong with a technique that does base wash and then highlight off of the wash. For me, I felt like washing always took the control away from me because I put it on the model and it would tint the whole model. And I was like, I didn't really want all of my model tinted. So I started being very specific. I would wash in in the shadows, wash in between muscle groups and never do like the whole model. And so I carry that on. When you see me do washes, it's typically like that. We might do some like around some of the leather straps, depending on how all that turns out. Um, but there's more models than not where I just never touch it. And as you work thin like this and you start pulling those highlights into narrower and narrower spots, you naturally get dark shadows that become, um, I guess they're just more natural, right? Because there's never a pigment added to create the shadow. The shadow is created, you know, uh, just genuinely through brightening up color on the model that makes those darker colors darker, you know? So relationally, I think it looks the same um, at the end, or it doesn't look the same, but it looks close enough to where if you get right, then you find yourself not having to use that technique at all. So good stuff. This is looking really good. Flesh tones, man, you guys are knocking out of the park. Everybody's looking fantastic. Got a little bit of time, let's look. Let's do one more refresh, see if we got anybody else throwing in their work in progress. One more, nice. Also, UG. Awesome, yep, good. Perfect, yep, perfect, digging it. Look at the hand, the hand, the knuckles are really popping. The shadows are really dropping in on the skin. Very, very natural flesh on every single one of these models that we're seeing from you guys. You've nailed it, you got it, right? And hopefully what you're seeing at home, whether you're painting the model or you're just watching me, is how easy it is. I hate saying easy. It takes dedicated time, it takes patience working through those, oh my God, what is this? Because the first layer of paint you put on looks like crap, right? Over black primer, Light flesh tone looks horrible. Yellows look horrible, but patience builds them up. And because you're working thin, that splotchiness goes away and turns into very natural transitions that create flesh. Because when you look at your skin, your skin is not smooth transitions. It is splotchy to some extent. So it actually works in your favor as you get used to doing this and as you layer it up and you start figuring where bright and dark spots go. All of you guys are killing it. Absolutely killing it. Love it. Great work. All right, let's take a look at some of these other picks that were thrown up here real quick. What is this? Holy Malifaux. Seriously? Grins, the beginning is of your Malifaux gremlins coming out the wazoo. You're going to love them, dude. Gremlins are so funny. Like, literally the most funny faction. It, like I always say, they kind of bring back the feel of original orcs and goblins in Warhammer Fantasy. You know, where like goblins, you know, chuckers and they were throwing grots at the enemy and stuff. It's just funny stuff. Guns can blow up in their face. Killing time painting, working on the base to a dragon. Want to make it look like ruins that were submerged. Any tips? 
I like what you got going on right now. Uh, a lot of what I do for that kind of used to be underwater, grimy, mossy effect, is to leave the greens till later on. So work up your, if this is stone and you got your color of stone with this kind of yellowy tan and then drop the greens on, then this is looking really good. If you wanna work it to where it's more of a, you know, let's say you're gonna brighten this up. I would tend to, because moss lays on top of the surface. So it's one of those situations where when you wanna add the green, unlike skin, where it's subdermal. So you want other skin tones on top of the green. When it's mossy, you want green to be one of the last things you do and build up from there. So if this is the color of stone you're looking for, I think it looks great. If you're planning on taking that stone to a lighter color, then you're gonna wanna add the green again later on too. But good, this is looking grimy. I mean, it does, right? It looks like it's got mossy, like if you touched it, it would be slick and slimy. I dig it. Oh God, scroll wheel, stop with the maniacal nonsense. Batman fan, your logo so far, let me know what you guys think. I This is awesome, dude. Trippy owl, best owl, look at this. He's, I think he's like having an acid trip or something. I love it though, man. These colors are so bright. Look at how it's oversaturating the camera and everything. This is great. I love it. I love the stars in the background. Neat. This is like how many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll pop? That's this guy on acid. I like it a lot. Uh, and then Uno Mas. Oh, Two Mas. Uh, no name. Hang on. Let me click the other one. I think this is a redo of that one. Does it have a title? Ninja Pete. What's going on, Ninja Pete? I love this. Great work here. We always talk about Death Guard. The fact that you came in with this dark brown really pops for me. This is awesome. That leather kind of, uh, I don't even know what you'd call this, this tabard on the front is awesome. And the fact that you've kept the armor and the bone with the dark green, uh, you know, kind of uh, dingy metallic trim on it for the old Death Guard colors works really, really well. Really well. The fact that you got this darkness coming into the, to the uh, horns as they approach the bones good, does a good job of separating that. I might even go darker on these and bring it out to where just the bright bone is out towards the tip to separate that contrast from the armor color to the bone a little bit more. But other than that, this is spot on, man. Love it. Great looking model. Good choice on the colors. I'm really digging it. I love the brown on the front. It makes him look like I like I expect like he's a like he's a blacksmith or something, right? This is really really cool. I like that a lot. And the bell is phenomenal. Good work. Good gritty nurgly stuff. Unamas wing. FNG Kang, not a paint along, but just finish this wing with your fly rent. Ah oh, man, I'm digging this. Okay, help me understand something. Is this paint? Or is this shine on the model, right? I, I feel like this is almost paint that you've done to give it a shiny webbing, which is phenomenal. I really dig that, great effect. We spend so much time making things look dull and, uh, and gritty in the 40K world that I'm really liking this if the intention is for you to have given it that sheen, that kind of wet snake skin sheen. I like that a lot, right? And uh, the skin looks really good. Really good. And I'm liking the kind of black or, or, or deep blue. It looks like black to red fade on the armor plating is really good as well. Good choice on colors. It's from the glazing medium. Okay, so it's giving it a sheen of its own. So it's created kind of a satin sheen on the model. I like that, man. I like the fact that if you're going to keep that, you might think about keeping that instead of keeping it flat. I really like the fact that it has some shine to it. Looks really good. All right, we got to get over to Kenny. Thank you guys so much. All the new follows, all the new support, all the guys paint along. Hopefully you guys will have more work for us tomorrow. Join us again at 2 p.m. Pacific. We'll be carrying on with this same dude, right? We will be carrying the Tribune up through the next colors, working on that flesh, bringing out some more uh, natural skin tones in it with, believe it or not, greens and purples. Yes, we're going to get crazy. And then we got to do some non-metallic metal on the, uh, on the armor. So uh, yeah, that'll be a joy. I know a bunch of you guys are anticipating that. All the guys that haven't done non-metallics yet, we're going to bull your brain. So, all right. Thank you so much. Head on over to Kenny's. We're going to pop Kenny a host at Next Level Painting, and then we're going to go raid his chat. So go throw up a bunch of emotes, some bomb snails, some hype. Uh, give him all the love. We're going to go hang out and watch him because I think he got some bomb wick brushes. So I'm going to go jump into his Discord real quick, talk with him a bit, and we will see you guys back again tomorrow. Ugg love from Arena Rex. Thank you so much for joining us. Look forward to having you hang out with us as we do this. Thank you. Everybody, make sure you jump some love and hype in the channel for Ugg and the guys at Arena Rex for making all this possible. Thank you, thank you, thank you for hanging out with us. And to everybody else, thanks for the support. Love your faces. We will see you back tomorrow. Adios, guys.
takes us. 